Universidad San Sebastián, Universidad Técnico Federico Santa María, Cardiff University, and RWTH Akan University, I would like to thank you for joining us today. Before we get started, I'd like to invite Dr. Beatriz Cámara, Research Director from Universidad Técnica Federico Santa María, who is going to say a few welcoming words. Thank you. Esteemed attendees, first and foremost, I wish to extend my warmest welcome to all of you to the third day of the third edition of Digital Transformation in the Development of Rehabilitation Sciences, the current challenge to use state-of-the-art technologies in their product management. Particularly, I would like to thank Dr. Matias Añartu, Director of the AC3E Center of our Universidad Técnica Federico Santa Maria, our organizing committee, and our visiting researchers. We are privileged to have Dr. Mariana Semprini, Semprini from the Italian Institute of Technologies, who works in robotics, brain, and cognitive sciences and Professor Adam Fogel, the dis who is the discipline lead in audiology speech pathology at the University of Melbourne. Their insights are undoubtedly enhance, will enhance our discussions today. I'd like to express our sincere gratitude to the National Agency for Research and Development, that is ANIT, and our collaborated partners, that is Universidad San Sebastián, Cardiff University, and RWTH Aachen University. Their invaluable support UTH has made this Aachen. event possible. Today, society faces monumental global challenges. These come from the climate change, poverty, and health. Health not only shapes the personal and professional well-being of those who face illnesses, but also defies, defines the quality of life for every human being. Yet, in this digital age, we are presented with cutting-edge technologies that can transform these challenges into opportunities. Disciplines such as artificial intelligence, biomechanics, uh, and robotics, among others we have explored in this event, emerge as tangible solutions to improve lives. In our Universidad Técnica Federico Santa Maria, we are very much interested in topics where engineering supports health disciplines. But beyond technology, it's the synergy of multidisciplinary teams that truly powers rehabilitation. Everyone is unique with needs that often require a collaborative approach from diverse specialists. It is up to us, the scientific community, to address these challenges with innovative, environmentally conscious, and empathetic solutions. I urge you all to listen, to connect, to renew your passion for science, and to recognize potential allies in our collective mission. While technology can be a potential tool, it's the collaboration among people that truly makes a difference in patients' lives. Let us continue working hand in hand to ensure that everyone receives the quality care they deserve, in line with the challenges of the 21st century. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Beatriz Camara, for your welcoming words. Um, so let's begin with our first talk today. Um, Mariana Semprini, Clinical Research Team Manager at the IIT Rehab Technology Lab of the Italian Institute of Technology. The topic today is Robotic Neuro Rehabilitation, Challenges and Open Issues.
to go. Um, mm -hmm. No worries. So um, you can start sharing your screen whenever you're ready. And then you can start your presentation. Yes, we can see your screen and yeah. Okay. 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 Um, thank you very much. I'm so sorry for this uh, technical problem. It was a very pleasure to be, to be here and thank you very much for the invitation. Um, so we will um, talk to you about what uh, we do at the React Technologies Lab of uh, IIT. But uh, first, I will spend a few words on uh, the institute I, I work in, which is the uh, Institute Italiano di Tecnologia, which is a private uh, institute that, that promotes uh, um, science and excellence, both uh, in fundamental and uh, applied uh, research. And uh, as you can see, we have, uh, um, uh, of course, we have many Italians <laughs> working there, but we also have people coming from almost uh, all over the world. And, uh, and we also have a good balance among the male and female um, researchers. Um, IFE is a network of different centers uh, spread around uh, Italy, and uh, we also have two centers in the US. And I come from Genova, the town here um, in the north by the sea. Uh, where there are different places, and, and I work here in Moldo, which is, the, the, we call it the headquarter, because it was the first building uh, <coughs> that was born uh, actually 20 years ago, we recently had um, uh, um, to celebrate our 20th um, anniversary. Um, so, um, <coughs> this is what the IIT does. As you can see, we have uh, four main uh, um, research lines. Uh, one is about uh, robotics, uh, we have nanomaterials, life tech, and computational sciences. So uh, researchers here generally work in one of these uh, domains. And then we have also um, transversal uh, missions, uh, both the scientific and uh, technology-driven uh, mission. And at the same time, uh, we, we try to um, address the societal challenges that uh, we are known uh, and, uh, through, uh, through our research. So, um, I will now present what we do actually in the AI Technologies Lab. So, we uh, specifically use robotic technologies that uh, are uh, very well developed uh, in general in our institute to restore uh, human abilities. So, um, why do we do this? The motivation is the one that um, Dr. Kamara just uh, um, uh, explained um, during the introduction. So, we have many people suffering from a spinal cord around the world. Also, um, many people worldwide are in need of a prosthetic uh, device. And finally, we have to cope with the uh, neurological disease, which affects many people. And uh, given the fact that the population is aging, this number is uh, sadly likely to increase. So we need to find solutions um, to these problems. Um, so this is us a few years ago. Now we are uh, more people. So we are mostly uh, engineers, but we also have uh, one physiotherapist in our group. Uh, we also have a psychologist and a neuroscientist. And uh, we do the research um, uh, with, uh, of course, the funding that um, you can see on top of my presentation and in collaboration with, um, with medical partners. Um, so this is what we do uh, in a nutshell. So uh, we have a strong focus on the robotics development. As you can see, we have uh, devices for uh, the upper and lower limb, and both um, prosthesis and exoskeletons. Um, then we have a part that focuses on neural engineering approach aimed at developing or identifying biomarkers, so metrics that can describe the functional um, abilities uh, of the patients and to see how this change along the rehabilitation process. And then we also explore the augmented or virtual reality to make rehabilitation um, more efficient, so to, to engage um, the patients in the rehabilitation. And of course, um, as I told you, we are mostly engineers, so we, we have to do this in collaboration with the uh, medical partners. Because again, as uh, Dr. Tamara said at the beginning, I mean, technology helps, but it's only through collaboration that uh, we really uh, make something useful for, for the patient, and I totally agree. 
So I will start by providing you with a quick overview of uh, the device that, uh, that we developed, starting from the exoskeletons. We have two, twin for the lower limb and float for, for the upper limb. Um, so for the development of the um, lower limb exoskeleton, we start with the focus group limitations. So this is a picture of, uh, uh, I mean, some years ago, I think it was almost 10 years ago, when we sit down with a spinal cord patient and ask them uh, what was the exoskeleton that they would like to use. And so they come up with a very simple instructions. Uh, so no super technological devices. They simply wanted something that could be used autonomously and that could be easy to put on and off, and uh, it had to be uh, used in combination with a wheelchair. So then, after some years, uh, the twin device was uh, was born. So twin has a... Uh, um, sorry, I cannot move again the presentation. Oops, I'm oh, sorry. There was a delay. So this is spoiler. <laughs> The, the next generation um, device. Okay, so um, uh, this, as I was saying, was the first the, the, the first uh, working prototype of the device. It has uh, four motors at the level of the hip and uh, on the knees. It has a battery and a control unit in the back. And, uh, and here you can see the braces where uh, here, um, hidden, there is an angle sensor that uh, detects when the patient is leaning forwards, mean, meaning that he wants to um, initiate a step. And so the exoskeleton then provides assistance to provide the steps according to the instruction of, uh, of the caregiver. Um, here you can see one of uh, our developers. This video clearly is accelerated, uh, mounting the, the device while, while seated. And uh, as you can see, it, is, uh, uh, it can be worn uh, very easily, and patients can, can do this by, by themselves. While uh, um, in here, you can see uh, a patient, a spinal cord uh, patient, using the device for, for the first time. Um, so of course, uh, we, we need the use of uh, the, um, uh, of the um, so, um, sorry, can you remember the English word for the, uh, <laughs> For another stump, when, well, anyway, uh, he's, um, uh, he's, uh, he's helping himself with the sticks to, to walk, but, uh, and you can see that he's uh, leaning forward a little bit, and then the exoskeleton is providing uh, assistance to the step. And this device is controlled by uh, an app on a, uh, on a tablet uh, that you can maybe see here on the side of the video um, that the physiotherapist uh, can, can use uh, during, um, during the exercise. Uh, then, of course, the exoskeleton uh, was changed, and now we have reached this uh, new design, which is uh, lighter and uh, possibly more efficient. We don't know yet. We are now testing it uh, with uh, clinical trials with, uh, with other patients. Uh, so now I will move to other limb exoskeletons. So um, in this slide, I am providing uh, an overview of the, um, of the devices that uh, are available on the market. So as you can see, on this device it has a fixed base. So this means that patients uh, use the devices while uh, seated, and the exercise that they do, and you can see it, uh, here and here, is uh, in a simulated environment uh, on the screen. So we, we spoke with our um, uh, clinical partners, and they said that they want a, a different device, something that allow, would allow the patients to do occupational therapies, so moving in the baby space. And so, um, uh, some years ago, the, uh, the, flow, the, fir the first uh, prototype of this device, uh, which we named the float, uh, was born. So, um, this in fact is uh, the prototype, but as you can see, it allows the, the, the person, and, and this is one of the developers as well, uh, can move around, therefore enabling uh, occupational therapies. And uh, in here, I'm sorry, I, I have some trouble with the, with the connection, apparently. apparently. Okay, um, so and, and here you can see a video of the, of the device that we finally had. So as you can see, this is an exoskeleton that allows the person to move um, around the, um, uh, the space, thanks to this fully articulated arm that uh, allows the person to move. 
Um, the device is also controlled uh, through um, uh, the control unit that uh, you can see here. Allows the person to perform um, a wide um, range of, uh, of motion, and we have uh, um, it has a different uh, uh, modalities for its control. So it can provide assistance in the vertical apps, but it also has an interesting feature. So in, here you can see the physiotherapist that is moving the arm of the person, um, and, uh, and then the, the device can repeat the trajectory that the, the, the physiotherapist just did. Um, and so the patient, uh, in this case it is also is one of the developers, while the physiotherapist is our real uh, physiotherapist, um, so the patient can repeat the movement that the, uh, the uh, physiotherapist has shown before. Um, then I will uh, talk about the prosthesis. Uh, again, we have two uh, prosthesis, one for the um, upper limb and one for the uh, lower limb. Um, so we start with uh, um, talking about the upper limb prosthesis. So the, the markets of uh, different devices depending on the, the price and the level of effectiveness. So we have very cheap and poorly effective devices, so for example, my electric or body power device with the digital um, grasp, or very expensive and effective device, but they still present some drawbacks. So the fact that um, uh, it is hard for the subject to learn to use uh, this complex device. So we decided to develop a, a device that could have, um, I mean, a reasonable price, but also be uh, very um, effective. And so um, we began the development of Agnes. So this is the first prototype, the, the, the one on the left. Uh, I don't know if you can see my cursor. Uh, I cannot. No, okay. Um, so this first prototype was developed in uh, 2014. Uh, and then it evolved uh, until 2018 uh, when it reached uh, the uh, certification for the European market. Um, the peculiarity of this hand is the fact that uh, it has only one motor, which is uh, placed in the center of the palm, and all the fingers are uh, linked together. So uh, the, the hands uh, close and adapts the, the grasp on, um, on the object um, to be grasped. And uh, I have here a video um, showing uh, it's, uh, how it, it works if it starts. Uh, okay. So um, this is again the, the, the first uh, um, prototype, the first working prototype, which has only two degrees of freedom, so opening and, uh, and closing. And it uh, works with uh, two um, electromyographic uh, sensors that are placed uh, on the um, uh, flexor and extensor muscle of the stumps. So when uh, the person um, extends the, the, the muscle of the wrist, the, the hand opens and when it flexes, the hand closes. And as you can see, um, our patient, um, uh, and uh, this patient is very special to us, is uh, more like a friend. And he sadly passed away very recently, so I'm, I'm happy to share um, with you uh, this video because he was, uh, I mean, he was one of the developers, we can say, because he provided all this very important feedback. Uh, and he can use the, the hand while performing very different, uh, um, very different tasks. And he also drives up to uh, our, our um, research center while, uh, while, while using our hand. Um, and then, um, we, um, uh, after the, 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 the um, clinical trials with his hand, we decided to move forward and, uh, and try to um, develop a device with uh, more um, uh, degrees of freedom. So not only opening and closing, but also with the, uh, pronation and supination and flexion extension. So we start um, exploiting the muscular activity that uh, you have when you perform these actions. And in here you can see Dario, um, one of our um, PhD students, that is using one of these uh, high-density MG devices. Um, so in here you can see uh, uh, reconstruction of the, of the signals that uh, with, the, with the color code represent the level of uh, electromyographic activation on the surface. And so we, uh, we start studying these uh, muscle patterns to check uh, whether we could use machine learning to detect the type of movement that uh, then could be communicated to the prosthesis to, um, to give the, the, the desired position. And, um, and so um, in this, um, the next video, I'm showing 
uh, an example of uh, another um, uh, of our oops, sorry, uh, it was too fast. Um, I'm so sorry, there is a, a delay, so I try to move slowly the slides, but sometimes um, um, it doesn't work. So, uh, I, I will, so in the video that you, uh, you will see in a minute, there is a, um, an amputated subject that is uh, uh, producing different patterns um, here, different patterns of uh, muscular activation with both hands. So, with, uh, with both uh, arms, uh, he's trying to reproduce in the movement that uh, he is here on the screen. And uh, uh, here, behind this uh, blue wrapper, there are electromyographic sensors uh, that are then um, co uh, that collect the signal that is converted through the control algorithm into costume of the hand. And uh, here, um, you can see the results. And so this, uh, this hand with a three degrees of freedom is also now being uh, investigated in a clinical trial. Uh, and then I would like to present the, the last um, development of, uh, of this project, which is uh, the, um, the, the, the completed arm, we call it Arm's Arm. So um, there is uh, the wrist, but there is also uh, the elbow. So um, these patients uh, underwent two surgical procedures. So one is osteointegration, meaning that there is a piece of metal inside this bone that can be used to attach the prosthesis because otherwise it would be too heavy to be attached to, um, to the arm. And then he also underwent uh, target muscle uh, regeneration, meaning that the nerves that previously uh, were, uh, um, were covering the muscle uh, responsible for moving the hand were replaced on, the, on his arm, meaning that we can retrieve from there the muscle si uh, signal that we need to drive the prosthesis. And, and here you can see he using, him using the device. Well, this was the first time that uh, he was using the device and he was very happy. And actually he was sad when we told him that uh, he could not bring the device home because it is further testing and of course certification. Um, so, yes, this is um, what we do with uh, the upper limb uh, prosthesis. And then finally, I, I would like to show you, um, ah, okay, uh, first of all, uh, we are very proud because uh, we, we published the, the results of the first step, uh, the first step of the development of AMES in science robotics, and we also obtained the Compassodoro Award, which is an award for best design that uh, um, we have uh, we have in Italy. And so it is a, a nice um, result that we share also together with the clinicians and, and with the patients, of course. Um, and then I will provide you an overview also of the lower limb devices that we have. This is the ECHO. Um, the ECHO has, um, is peculiar because it has a self-adaptive mechanism, meaning that uh, it uh, adapts um, uh, the, uh, its uh, inclination depending on the, on the terrain and uh, on the slope that patient can find while uh, wearing or also um, while, uh, while using the stairs. And this is something that uh, um, uh, not all the prosthesis uh, have, and therefore was, uh, was very desirable uh, according to them. Um, then we have the hybrid knee. We call it hybrid uh, because it works uh, both as a passive prosthesis, um, which is uh, silent and therefore uh, very much appreciated by um, patients because it is uh, discreet, but also um, uh, sometimes when they need to, for example, stand up uh, or do the stairs uh, and so on, they can uh, switch its behavior to that of an active prosthesis. Uh, and therefore it can uh, provide assistance um, to the patients. So these, these two devices are uh, the, the newest, I would say, in our lab, and uh, we are um, conducting uh, um, uh, some tests to, um, to, to, to check whether, uh, of course, uh, it is useful, if we need to refine the, the design, and so on. Um, so this, uh, this shows you that uh, um, uh, we, in the lab, we operate what we call a co-creative process in which we continuously um, take the feedback of the patients and uh, of the clinician, of course, into consideration, which is fundamental to build a really useful device uh, and not just write uh, um, nice papers. So uh, now I will uh, talk about the uh, number rehabilitation, which is uh, what I mainly do. So I, I, I am not one of the developers of uh, the device, but I, um, I, I investigate 
uh, rehabilitation through the use of, uh, of this device. Um, the approach that uh, we use is to have a um, brain in the loop, as we have called it. So, um, and our mission is to extract the functional biomarkers of uh, neuroplasticity that are induced by the training using our robots. Um, in fact, here, for example, you can see uh, one of our students that uh, is performing a simple reaching task in the 3D uh, space. And um, this task is inspired by uh, occupational therapists because, uh, um, I mean, uh, it is similar to putting, for example, reaching uh, for a cup or on a shelf or a book. And when doing this, um, she also has, um, as you can see, high density EEG headset and also many sensors for collecting EMG recordings. Because we want to, to see what happens uh, really not only in the body, in the muscle, but also in the brain when uh, she performs uh, this um, motor task. Therefore, this will, uh, we believe that this will allow us uh, to, uh, to extract these functional biomarkers that are objective and that we try to correlate with the clinical case that the clinicians um, generally use. Um, and therefore, this could be, um, could then in turn help us to develop uh, um, objective measures to provide better uh, diagnosis or prognosis. And then we also want to explore the loop architecture in which our devices, for example, take the, the virus signals of the patients into account during uh, the day control. So maybe not necessarily real time, but in order to have really an as needed rehabilitation, which is fundamental to help uh, the patient to, to learn. Um, I and mean, we believe that this, is a, this could be a, a, useful, um, a useful approach. Um, so I will, uh, I will now provide an overview of the um, experiments that uh, we performed in this direction. So this is uh, what we call uh, NEBULA, uh, which stands for Neuromechanical Biomarkers for Upper Limb Assessment. And, and you just saw the video of this experiment. Um, and the scientific questions that we ask ourselves in this case are which measurements related to motor control have the potential to improve neurorehabilitation? And also, can they be conveyed into biomarkers to improve, to improve our um, prototypes for robotic uh, rehabilitation? Um, and so to do this, um, as you saw, we, we, we asked the subject to perform a simple task using the robot, but then uh, we also have the person doing the task without the robot. Then we collect the biomarker from um, the brain, from the muscle, and then we have, of course, the kinematics of the robot or of the person. And we um, extracted what we call movement profile. So the, um, the script of the movement in the two conditions, with or without the robot, and uh, which is um, uh, very useful information because it can provide us uh, um, information, of course, about the, the movement, but also can be useful to assess the device. So um, is the device affecting the way I move, uh, especially um, in, the, in this case uh, in which I'm testing the device with empty people? Because if we want our device to be um, useful to provide rehabilitation, we must be sure that it doesn't alter the, um, the motor output or it doesn't alter too much the, the motor output of an empty person wearing the, the device. Um, so to assess this, we, um, we, uh, we, we have begun uh, analyzing our data in two different ways. First, by looking at the brain. So is the robot modulating neural activities? And uh, we quantify it in terms of um, uh, event-related synchronization and desynchronization, which means that we um, analyze the brain power uh, in the alpha and beta band with respect to the baseline, so when the subject is not moving. And uh, as you can see here in this plot, uh, here we are recording the brain modulation without exoskeletons in the two bands, alpha and beta, and then in two conditions, one while using the robot. So with the exoskeleton with a low level of assistance, and then with the exoskeleton with a high level of assistance. And the red dots indicate a statistical difference with the condition without the exoskeleton. So what uh, we can say here is that the neural modulation is the same, but somehow the desynchronization of the alpha and beta power uh, is um, uh, deeper when the subjects are, are using the device. Uh, and then we have the same question, but uh, in terms of uh, motor output. So by looking at uh, electromyographic signals and uh, muscle synergies. 
So uh, we will do that. Uh, as you probably saw from the, the video before, we collected lots of uh, EMG signals from uh, um, the arm and, and the back and the shoulder, and then we extract muscle synergies. So um, very quickly, um, muscle synergies means that we decompose the EMG signals into an invariant part that, um, that is describing which muscles are recruited together in a certain uh, moment, for example, and then the temporal coefficients that uh, tells you uh, when this group of muscles are, um, are really recruited. And, and so we compute the muscle synergies uh, by considering only the free movement, so without the robot, and this is the results, we have uh, five synergies, and then we collect the synergies using the entire data set. So the data set of the um, free uh, movement and also the, the movement with the robot. And we found exactly the same synergies plus a new one. Because if you look at this, um, if you compare these two uh, plots, and you can see that synergy one in the free movement corresponds to synergy two, to the synergy one of the uh, whole data set, synergy two corresponds to synergy two, three with the three, Synergy 4 corresponds to this synergy, the number 5, and 5 with 6. But if we consider the movement with the robot, we have a fourth synergy. Um, I don't know if you are able to read my, my labels, but uh, um, this synergy involves the simultaneous activation of the, the muscle of the capitions. So um, we interpret this as a, um, a synergy that is related to the postural uh, control of the back. Which um, makes sense because uh, while they're wearing exoskeleton, people stay um, straight with their back because uh, they also have strap around uh, their waist. So um, I think that we, we believe that this is a nice result because the robot is not altering the muscle synergies that we have in a free normal movement, but simply there is an additional synergy that uh, um, is related to the, to the use of the, to the, of the device. Um, then, uh, in, the, in the same direction, we are also exploring how the robot is affecting the experiment and uh, exercise in a genetic chain, so in the, in the two cases. Um, and again, we try to um, investigate whether this uh, changes in terms of muscular activation and uh, uh, in the kinematics. Um, so here we have a, a few results. So in this case, we are uh, looking at the ratio between the upper and lower cap issues in a free exercise. In pink, you have the condition with the robot and the, uh, in blue, the condition without the robot. So this ratio um, should be around one, more or less, for uh, when um, in normal conditions so without the robot. And this is true also for um, the first exercise with the robot. But it changes uh, when we use the exoskeleton. And so again, this information are very important for the clinicians because uh, the clinicians need to know that they, if they use device to perform this exercise, they need to take into account the fact that the uh, motor output could be different. Uh, while in here on the right, I am reporting the, the, level, the, the degree variation of certain joints of, uh, um, in this case, of uh, the elbow, the knee and the elbow, while here in the shoulder. And um, you can see that um, here for the arm, the, the, the degree, the level of uh, uh, the range of movement is more or less the same, while there is a, a, a bit of difference uh, in the shoulder. While this is BMG, which is simply, um, which simply indicates that uh, there is a different timing uh, in the activation, but the, sh the, sh the shape um, is the same between the, the two movements. Um, then, uh, another experiment that we are currently um, running, uh, we call it MIRAR, and, uh, uh, which stands for Motor Imagery Reinforced by Augmented Reality. Because um, it is known that uh, according to the functional equivalence uh, theory, uh, when you um, move explicitly or when you imagine to move, the same brain areas are um, engaged. So some people began thinking that motor imagery could be used for motor, um, for initiating a motor learning, and this could be very useful, for example, uh, in acute phase when the patients cannot move at all. Um, and, uh, but the results so far have been uh, very um, different and not convincing. 
So uh, we, we decided to uh, investigate whether uh, using motor imagery, but together with the actual observation, um, use um, uh, with uh, um, obtained sorry by uh, the use of virtual reality, could improve the effect of motor imagery and therefore of the motor learning. So in this case, we asked the person uh, now without the robot to perform the, the same task. But uh, people, uh, the same task that you saw in the first video, so when there was a reaching towards a target that was indicated by a light turning on. And uh, so we divided people into groups, one performing physical tasks and another group performing uh, only an imagined task. And both groups uh, were performing the task into different conditions. The normal one, so with in front of them the, the physical panel, or an augmented condition, so with the, um, uh, while wearing a, a, a device for augmented reality, and so having in front of them a, a, this, um, this display, so a, a virtual panel with a virtual arm moving towards the direction uh, of the target. And, um, and then we looked at, at the um, EEG data uh, in the two conditions. So this is the physical condition and this is the augmented condition for the two groups, the motor imagery and the motor execution group. So you can see that before the movement, so this presence for um, before starting the movement, brain modulation um, is exactly the same in all the condition and in all the group. But uh, during the movement, First, we, we don't have a different activation. This is again is a event related uh, desynchronization. Um, so we don't have a difference, uh, or at least a statistical difference between uh, the two groups, but we have a different modulation uh, for uh, the, the augmented condition. And so we are, we are now trying to see if um, this also translates in, um, in, uh, in promoting uh, the motor learning because, uh, I mean, this is not uh, um, what we have uh, um, looked so far. Right now we want to see um, uh, whether the brain modulates differently the, the two conditions. Uh, then I, I will talk about this uh, other um, experiment. So it is uh, um, an analysis of reach and grasp using a sensor fusion approach. So um, this experiment goes into the direction of uh, see of um, exploring which signals are uh, useful for drive a uh, complex prosthesis. So we ask uh, um, healthy people to perform reaching and grasping movements while collecting a lot of data. So we have uh, EMG signals, we have uh, high density EMG signals, INU, then we have motion capture markers, and then a sensorized log. And, uh, and, and the idea is to explore um, which of these um, signals are more informative during a, a specific movement. And then we would like to, to combine all this information um, together to see if a sensor fusion approach, so meaning we collect different kinds of signals but conveying the same information, provides more information and therefore better performance of the prosthesis that one modality alone. And uh, um, this is an example of um, analysis that, that we are doing. In this case, we are um, uh, looking at the muscle synergies. So again, uh, we decompose the EMG signals into uh, muscle synergies that are um, displayed like this. So this, the, the color indicates which muscles are active during uh, a given movement with the kinematic synergies that are more or less the, the, the same. So uh, again, the kinematic uh, um, uh, movement of the joints of the hand that we collected with the motion capture and uh, with the glove are decomposed into um, invariant uh, synergies that we call postural synergies that uh, uh, indicate simultaneous movement on the hand. And uh, we find a very good correspondence between the muscle synergies and the kinematic synergies, indicating that uh, um, muscle activity decomposing to muscle synergies can be used to drive the prosthesis into uh, a desired um, position. This, of course, has been not yet um, implemented in real-time prosthesis, but um, we are going into this direction. We are exploring this, uh, this possibility. Um, then I would like to spend a few words on the other uh, topics that uh, we aim to, um, uh, to explore in the next future. So one is digital health. 
So um, we recently started a project in which uh, we had to develop um, a new uh, setup with uh, many sensors um, that can monitor the person uh, 24 hours and so uh, they can provide a, a lot of information for the clinician to really monitor disease because um, this is very important, the, the, the continuous monitoring is fundamental for many, um, for many diseases because sometimes persons go to the doctor and they, they, they are good, the clinical skills are good, but then there are many fluctuation of their functionality and performance during the day, during the weeks, and therefore it is important to, um, to have systems that allow continuous uh, monitoring um, unobtrusively and uh, non-invasively. And then another thing that we want to explore, uh, specifically in relation to prosthesis, is uh, embodiment, because um, we, we want to, um, as you probably uh, infer from uh, um, what I told you, we try to develop prosthesis that are very, use, uh, very easy to use. And this is because uh, an issue that we have um, in Italy, but I mean uh, worldwide, is the fact that uh, uh, there is a high abandonment rate of prosthesis because uh, advanced prosthesis are very difficult to, to use. So in order to promote device use, we also have to work towards the embodiment and so for, um, uh, in order to have uh, the, the person uh, feeling the prosthesis as part of their body, we need to work on closed loop system. So, so far we have been working on uh, um, getting the signal out of the body and to the prosthesis, but now we, do, uh, we need to really do the opposite. So having a signal coming from the prosthesis, for example, its position, and communicating it back to the subject um, non-invasively. Um, in, because that, that's what we do, of course. And um, so, for example, we are starting exploring with tactile feedback uh, how to provide uh, information to the subject about uh, how uh, wide is the opening of the hand, for example, or how rotated um, is the wrist. And then, of course, uh, we, we need to keep investigating natural and, and robust control, uh, control algorithm. Um, then, before I conclude, I would like to tell you that I, with uh, some colleagues, uh, I am, uh, um, um, am co-guesting a research topic in uh, Frontiers on uh, innovative approach to promote stroke recovery. And um, importantly, uh, Frontiers has a fee support program uh, available. So in case, uh, uh, I mean, anyone has a, a, a nice work or a paper that want to publish, um, this is a possibility and uh, I'll be happy to, to help you with this, um, uh, to, to get information in case. Uh, and with this I, I conclude and I thank you very much for your attention and uh, I'll be happy to, uh, to answer your question. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Mariana, for your amazing talk. Um, I have some questions here. Um, I'd like to start with the most popular one. Um, what type of sensors and control strategies are you using for the escalator and processes? Any machine learning running in the real time? Okay, yes. So, for um, the prosthesis, of course, we have um, real time machine learning. Generally, uh, what we do is uh, to um, collect uh, signals from uh, EMG, so that's the type of sensors uh, that we use. Um, then we test uh, offline uh, which uh, um, uh, algorithms are working better for decoding the um, prosthesis postures. And uh, uh, like we have uh, convolutional neural networks, artificial neural networks, uh, or, but also linear discriminant analysis, regressor, all these kind of, uh, um, of methods. And then uh, we decide which one uh, is um, more efficient in terms of performance and also computation time. And then we deploy it on, uh, on, the, uh, on the prosthesis for uh, real-time use. For the exoskeletons, it depends uh, on the um, uh, and the pathology that we are targeting. So, um, for uh, the exoskeleton, the video that you have seen for the lower limb exoskeleton, it was position control, but then we also uh, developed a new version of the control algorithms for neurologic patients, uh, for stroke patients. So, in that case, uh, the assistance is provided only 
to one uh, leg, the, uh, the, the pledge leg, while the other one has the transparent control. Um, so it depends on, uh, on the specific case that we are uh, considering. Okay. All right. Thank you, um, Mariana. Can you hear me well, right? I, you're, right, you have noticed I cannot hear you. <laughs> oh, okay, right. Just give me a second. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. Okay, great. Thank you so much for your answer. Um, I'm moving forward for the next question. Um, are the machine learning algorithm uh, trained specifically for each patient to recognize the high density surface EMG patterns or how do you generalize for the wide variety of um, potential position? Okay, this is really a great question. So this is um, um, a very important issue. So, so far we have been using uh, training for each patient separately. But uh, I mean, the, the, this is um, this is not a good option because uh, often uh, the the patient, the, the the control algorithm perform perfectly after the training, but then as patient uh, move away or maybe there is sweat or the electrodes move, the, the control um, the decrease, the control performance decrease, and so we are starting um, different to explore different strategies. Uh, first uh, is uh, the use of uh, incremental um, uh, um, uh, learning or enforcement learning algorithm. But another possibility that uh, we would really like to explore, but we have not done it yet, yet would be the, uh, the inclusion of data coming from uh, different patients to, to make a, a, a really robust algorithm. But this is something that uh, we, we aim to do uh, at some point, but uh, um, we have not explored yet. Okay, thank you. Um, another question is, what safety constraints do the skeletons have? What safety, you mean? Yeah, con uh, yeah constraints. Constraints, um, like in terms of uh, which patients um, can, can use. Oh, of course, we have an inclusion criteria. Uh, so we have uh, um, the, the exoskeletons because as you can see as different uh, size I mean if you are referring to the lower limb one um, so we have constraints um, according to uh, the, um, the height or the weight of, uh, of the patients uh, but we are also working in this direction because the exoskeleton was first developed for spinal cord patients that are generally very thin but now it's been adapted also to neurologic patients that are um, uh, different, and so we, we, we realized that many patients could not fit in our exoskeleton. So, but the, the safety um, the constraints and all the inclusion criteria are always discussed with the clinicians. Okay, thanks. Um, how many channels do you need for your EG, EEG sorry, research in this topic and why? Okay, uh, another very good question. So, um, so far, as, um, as you can see, um, we have been exploring a high density EEG, uh, so with uh, 128 channels, and then uh, we perform source localization to, um, to obtain information about the, the, the source. So we, we not always uh, perform sensor level analysis, but also source analysis. Um, Again, the number of sensors is something that we want to explore, given that uh, for my research we are not directly in, patient, uh, in contact with the patient for use in the clinics, we, we, uh, we collect the widest variety of, uh, of data, but then the idea is to see which one is really relevant to scale down, because then when you are with patient you don't want to waste patient's time to, to, um, to put the gel, for example, so this is um, something that again we are investigating. So, for, for example, the, uh, the modulation that I show you for the motor imagery task was uh, only, uh, in that case, uh, only the um, electrodes uh, in the motor cortex that uh, could be relevant. But uh, uh, since we do not know a priori which areas are, are involved or are interesting to see, we prefer to collect uh, all of them. But then, of course, for, uh, uh, before we move to practical application, we, we need to scale down this number. Okay, thank you. Um, I have two last questions. Um, one is, how does your institute translate these research efforts to the clinic? Are these products sold directly from the institute? 
Okay, um, no. Um, so we have been uh, solding uh, two of our exoskeletons, but only for research purposes. Um, so uh, we have a technology transfer directory that helps uh, um, the, a device uh, um, being part of a startup and therefore the industrialization is uh, out of, uh, uh, of our institute. And then um, uh, the, the, I told you that we collaborate a lot with the clinical uh, uh, partners, but we really have joint labs. So we establish formal uh, joint uh, um, uh, structures so that we can really work together. Okay, thank you. And the last question. We have an ICOV um, robot from your institute at the AC3E Center in Chile, which we just saw okay. this morning, <laughs> which is used for cognitive robotic research here. Yeah. Are you using that platform for investigating rehabilitation engineer in any ways? Uh, not uh, my group specifically, but uh, there are other groups that are doing this and um, especially for um, autism, so they have seen that uh, rehabilitation with the robot is very helpful with uh, um, autistic children. And then um, we have in IIT uh, another robot, uh, and, uh, another humanoid robot, uh, its name is R1, and that has been used together with the um, clinicians to uh, provide indication to the subject, to the patient, about uh, what to do. And, uh, and then uh, the robot is also able to observe the patient and uh, extract the metrics related to the way uh, he moved. So these, I would say, are the two approaches that uh, are used in our institute to uh, perform rehabilitation using humanoid robots. All right. Thank you so much, Mariana, for your amazing and interesting talk today and for your answers. And um, we don't have any more questions. So uh, thank you again and have a lovely night uh, in Italy. Thank you. Thank you so much for the invitation and sorry about the technical issues that I had. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, let's continue with our second talk today. Um, Dr. Matias Sañartu, faculty member of Voice Production Lab from uh, Federico Santa Maria Technical University. The title today is Resident Engineer Tools for Voice Rehabilitation. Thanks a lot. That was a wonderful talk. Um, I enjoyed it a lot. And there's a bit of a connection with the work we do in robotics. Um, and I'm, I'll be touching base with that. Uh, I wrote the last question, of course. Um, so I am the director of uh, the Advanced Center for Electrical and Electronic Engineering here at the Universidad Tecnica Federico Santa Maria. And uh, unfortunately, as part of this, uh, visit. Uh, we don't have a schedule, a, a second tour. We had a tour this morning, but we don't have a second tour. If you're interested, we may want to arrange something separately at some point with those who are interested. So if you are, let me know and we'll try to figure out something afterwards at some point. Probably not today. Um, okay, uh, let's see. So the center, uh, I'll talk very briefly about the center. It's a uh, it's a group of people not only from Santa Maria, it's hosted here. We are leading the project, but it involves other universities. It's composed with eight universities. San Sebastián has a researcher from there as well, um, and involves 37 uh, researchers with a good number of postdocs, a large number of students of all different uh, programs. Is all good? Yeah? All good. Um, and, and technical staff who are helping us to translate the research we do in the lab into uh, industry and society in general. Uh, it's, a, it's a few blocks uphill. Uh, it's not on campus, but it's next to the campus. 
Uh, are, are you not seeing this yes, in yeah. the... No. Oh, yeah. sorry. I was super excited. Yes. <laughs> this is me being excited. Sorry about that. So um, it's, a, it's a group of uh, a number of people. Um, as I said, we're a few blocks uphill um, with a wonderful view. This is a real picture. I always put this picture because it's, it's to show that it's a real thing. So I put myself in the picture. It's not Photoshop. It's a real, it's a real thing. Um, so, so the center has these ability of, of spaces for uh, meeting for students. Uh, it's, a, it's a whole operation where we thought uh, of research in a different way. So different universities, different groups within the same university, uh, uh, different topics, all working together in a very interdisciplinary way. Uh, so it's a fantastic place to work, to do research. And it's well equipped with uh, the technology to develop electronics, to do research in rehabilitation sciences as well, uh, and of course in the core of electronic engineering uh, as the base of that. Um, so we have, within the topics that we work, we have a focus, we have three different areas of concentration areas or application areas. One of them is developing technology for, uh, for health, for the health tech sector. So, so in, in this realm, we have, we develop biomedical sensors, devices, we do analytics, we do software, we do machine learning, we do modeling as well. And, and all of that in, in many ways is combined into neural and rehabilitation engineering. So uh, you'll see two companies outside today, uh, Dory and Lanik. And those are companies, Lanik was actually created within the center. It's a startup company from the center. I'm one of the co-founders. I should have said that at the beginning. I have no conflict of interest uh, since it's all regulated by the university. Um, and, uh, and Dory is developing uh, the technology in, in our center. So we help companies to do uh, things like that, to rethink about the products and to add this layer of high-tech development uh, for the different products. So, so it's, a, it's kind of a, a nice thing for Chilean companies to have the opportunity to develop technology and the project we're doing with them is funded, uh, you'll see it outside, it's funded by Corfo in Chile uh, and, and allows the companies to try to reach beyond the typical business models. Um, and we've done projects with, with Corelco in Chile, with other companies, with hospitals as well. So a number of things. And we have also projects in, with, with hospitals, not only in Chile, but also in the United States. My lab in particular um, is, develop, is devoted to voice production. Uh, and within the center, we have space that we share with other friends and colleagues in the area. Uh, and we do high-speed video imaging with ENT doctors. So this is a high-speed video camera connected to endoscopes to visualize vocal folds and in a unique way so you can see the dynamics. Um, and, and so we invite ENT doctors, like this gentleman here, to do, perform the endoscopies for us. And we, we work in, in, in collaboration with them and with different hospitals in the area and in Santiago. Hospital Clinico de Santiago de la Universidad de Chile um, el Hospital Van Buren y Hospital Gustavo Frique. Uh, and with different doctors so, uh, who participate in this effort running these uh, experiments. Some of them are wild, like this one here, uh, the one that looks like an X Wing ship. You have no idea what that is, right? 
that's a Star Wars thing. Um, it's a mask where you can record uh, airflow. So you're breathing, you're speaking, you're measuring aerodynamics, and at the same time, we're doing high-speed video uh, analysis through your nose. So it's pretty neat. Um, and since we're interested in not just the biomechanical and the acoustical components, uh, and the aerodynamic component, we're also interested in motor control. We do have also the capability of providing uh, EEG. Uh, so we do uh, electrophysiology as well. And we have uh, 128 channel EEG, uh, which I was very pleased to hear that I, I picked the right number for the number of electrodes. That was my question too. Um, yeah, we, ha we have a, a also uh, other stuff like anechoic chambers that we use for certain things. A good number of products that we have bought and some of those that we have developed. We are exploring things and I was very happy to see that some of these things are being explored in other topics. For instance, high density uh, EMG. High density EMG is a technique uh, to record several surface uh, electrodes at the same time to do source analysis and to get a better uh, estimate of what's happening. Uh, not only, it's typically used in, in, in arms or in, in other body parts, but we're using it in, at the larynx. Uh, and we have also developed technology to do endoscopy and project a laser grid so you can see the larynx and you measure things in physical units, which is not as easy as it, you think it is. And, but this is a school of engineering. So what we do is primarily models. So models of the vocal folds, um, so we record, we record high-speed videos like that one. We analyze those. These are new techniques for analysis using statistics uh, of the vocal edge, uh, and we perform here uh, Bayesian analysis to estimate the most probable uh, behavior of the vocal folds. And we take all of that and create models. Some of them are silicon models. Uh, most of what we do, though, is primarily in mathematical models of both the vocal folds, the larynx, the control, the lungs, and so on. Uh, and this one is very important for us. It was developed last year. It has a full intrinsic laryngeal muscle control. So you can estimate what the effect of the larynx uh, of the different muscles, and it's simple. So you can run it thousands of times and, and do mappings and machine learning and so on. And we, more recently, this year, we developed another one that has also extrinsic muscles, which is very neat. Uh, it adds the idea of, I want to understand what's, happen, what's happening not only within the larynx, but also outside of the larynx, because there are many being uh, used. It would be nice to have this in the clinic, but it's not really feasible. The other thing that it would be nice to have uh, for typical evaluation is intrinsic uh, electromyography, so measuring the, the muscles. The muscle activity would be nice, because we would always talk about, like, you should reduce the, the tension in your neck, and you should do this and that but we really have no idea what you're doing really with the muscles because it's so hard to measure. It's so hard, it's so invasive. And when you do it, uh, it's kind of also 
a dangerous thing, so people don't do it in the clinic unless you have paralysis or something that it's really major, but for a typical assessment, it's not done. And it's something that we would like to have it done. Um, so I'm going to show you a way that we're thinking about this uh, to get these two components. These are highly desirable but difficult to get, invasive methods um, that we would like to get typically. So for contact pressure, I'm going to show you two ways to do it with models. One is a model that is a model of the vocal folds and, and estimates um, how, how you get this pressure by deforming the, the, the vocal fold. This is like bouncing a, a ball and when it hits the ground, if you see it in slow motion, you will see how the ball is actually deformed and by looking at the deformation of the ball, you can get what the pressure was. So that's sort of the, the idea. Uh, and you can estimate the contact pressure. And this is only by looking at the video. So we have this idea with a former student of mine uh, who's currently in Boston. And uh, we recently tested it against the real sensor. And this is the comparison. So, so you see in red and blue, these are the lines of the vocal fold edges. And what you see as a continuous line is the signal that you get from the sensor, the true sensor, and the red lines, which are like simple marks, are our estimates only using video. And we're pretty close, sufficiently close to say that this is good enough for an assessment. It's only visual. We're not using anything other than the video. So, which means that with the video, we can get pretty close to what you would get with the sensor which means that you don't need the sensor for most of the things. So the key thing is to make sure you validate your approach. So we are proposing these things, but you need to test and make sure and try to destroy your own technique as much as you can to make sure that it works, to make sure that it's robust. We don't want to develop something that it's only used under these ideal circumstances. This is something that we developed to be robust, so we're further testing it, but we're very excited because it seems to be a simple way that you can have as a plug-in in your stroboscopy, and you can get estimates of uh, vocal fold contact pressure. We were so excited that we actually put a patent on this, because we think this is a plug-in that we can sell to K-Pentax or whatever is selling strops or whatever who's selling these endoscopes to potentially have a simple add-up to their software so they can produce this data. Uh, another way to do this, more complicated way, but it produces more output so it, it will produce also muscle activation, is this idea of creating, running these simple models, the one that I told you about, running it thousands of thousands of time, and then created a neural network representation, a mapping, and then you solve the inverse problem. So given this output, given the sound pressure, the you know, fundamental frequency, the spectral tilt of the harmonics, the capstroke peak coefficient, whatever you can come up with a bunch of different outputs. You take that and you look for the inverse solution. So what was the thing at the beginning that would produce this output? And you can get from our model, we've done some validations, and you can get nice estimates of, of the contact pressure and muscle activation in this way. This is a core of what we're currently doing, and it's the work of several students in my lab. I recently was published uh, by Emilio Ibarra here in the room, who was proposing a way to do transfer learning to make it even better, like specific to you. And, and the estimates are even better if you do it that way. So, so we're very excited that the potential of techniques like this are amazing. And you can get contact pressure, you can get estimates of muscle activity, and you can get them even with a simple accelerometer as an as a input sensor. Of course, as I said before, this is something we're further testing, making sure that it's robust, that it's consistent, but so far everything is indicating that this is a very feasible way to go forward. Um, this is an example of, of one of the validations we did. Using the accelerometer as an input, uh, we were able to get uh, uh, estimates of subglottal pressure, you were saying pa 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 the typical thing you do with the Rothenberg mask, and and we are estimating the subglottal pressure in between the p sounds, uh, and we're right there where we should be in terms of what we think about voice production. And this is one of the estimates of the muscle activity using recordings from that picture. That picture is 
is one of our collaborators, James Heaton from, from, from MGH, who did that to himself. Those, the, those electrodes, he's a professor teaching this thing in, in Harvard, so I guess he knows what he's doing. Uh, but he did that with assistance of other person and got all the recordings of EMG. So we're comparing our estimates again against uh, his uh, data. And we're pretty excited that, once again, we're very close to what we think it should be, at least for this data that we have here. And um, sorry, I'm going to drink water. Very close to what we think it should be. And then we decided to this data that we have here. Move this uh, into the idea of something new for the clinicians. So for those of you who are doing anything related to therapy, um, we think there's a new tool that is going to change everything and the way we do therapy with patients. Um, it's the idea of having a monitor that keeps track of the patient throughout the day. So it's, a, it's an ambulatory voice monitor. There have been several uh, efforts for, the, for this. Um, it was done in the 2000s by Bob Hillman in the first version. Uh, then it took over. Uh, it was too big, and then they, some other group developed a simpler version. Uh, and for our research purposes with the group at, at MGH, we developed this platform that was using a cell phone. And we recorded an accelerometer signal into the cell phone and kept track of that signal throughout the day. Um, currently, and this is uh, part of what, what it, it ended up becoming a company that you'll see outside, Atlantic, uh, we developed something that was independent from your phone. And it has better capabilities in many ways. It has a microphone, <coughs> acceleration, and we're adding all of the analysis that I told you about into the signal analysis for, for this uh, device. So this was meant to be initially uh, for nodules, muscle tension, dyphonia patients. But of course, the market, uh, uh, it's a bit small if you want to launch a product like that. So, so the company now is looking at several other applications related to um, Parkinson's and related to, they're investigating other potential avenues for this, for this particular development. Um, so there are many opportunities where this can be used. And there are others who are also developing similar tools. So I think this is really, which is great. It's great that, that a bunch of people think that this is a good idea, because hopefully uh, it will become a standard thing, uh, and we will leave uh, some of the basic tools that are still using clinic, like Jitter, Shimmer, which we know they don't really provide much of information. And we think that with tools like this, you can get a much better idea of what's happening with, with the therapy throughout the, the, the period where that's happening. Uh, yeah, and that continues to be developed and, and reduced and further, since we're engineers, we like to develop the hardware as, as, as much as we can. Um, and yeah, so, so there are techniques uh, for analysis. This is another one uh, that produces, uh, from the accelerometer, produces um, aerodynamic features like MFDR, AC flow, uh, open quotient, and whatnot. So it's, it's very uh, useful in that regard. And with that data, uh, clinicians currently, uh, particularly uh, as, as MGH is the leading hospital doing this, they have developed this basic idea where they do logistic regression with the data. So they compare the two main features. And they have seen how, and it's very simple, uh, but it can be very effective given its simplicity to separate patients from controls and even to keep track of patients during the therapy. So these are becoming tools that can really be used in the clinic given the simplicity. So they have developed a model for nodules and for muscle tension dysphonia. We're doing, since we're engineers, we like to do more complicated things. We've done a, a bunch of machine learning methods, analysis, uh, using mapping and reducing the dimensionality of the signal into something different. So we look at pictures like the one on the right, which is a, it's a manifold way of looking at the data. 
Uh, so there are many ways. I think the future is very promising in terms of what you can do with this data and, and, and the type of analysis that you can do. Hopefully better classifying and creating phenotyping of voices because we know that patients are not always behaving the same way. We know that muscle tension dysphonia is a weird problem and many people are doing different things and we want to understand why that is. Um, and the last thing I wanted to talk to you about uh, this is a connection with the robot that I mentioned at the beginning, is this idea of connecting hearing with voice. Um, we know, that, of course, there's a production, there's a connection associated with the auditory feedback, and this connection has been uh, taken into models primarily by Frank Gunter at Boston University with this thing called the DIVA model, the DIVA Neurocomputational Model. It's a need model that allows you to do uh, understanding of speech acquisition, um, but the thing that tracks, uh, that it's being tracked here is essentially your formant, formant frequency. So essentially the position of your tongue. That's, that's the tracking you're doing. Uh, it has no connection whatsoever with the larynx, so nothing related to pitch, nothing related to loudness, um, nothing related to voice quality, so therefore it's not really useful for the things I'm interested, which are related to voice disorders. So we collaborated with Frank uh, through uh, our very strong collaboration with BU through Kara Step, uh, and we developed this laryngeal version of Diva. We could call it laryngeal Diva or La Diva. I was very creative. <laughs> uh, this work was 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 led in collaboration with with one a doctoral student. Uh, Hassini in, in Kara's lab, and we came up with this idea of adding uh, larynx in the model. So this is Diva at the, its best, but with the larynx as well. So you're controlling the muscles of the larynx, and we did that with the model that we developed. Uh, and we compare that with real experiments, behavioral data for perturbation, pitch perturbation, and, and pitch, the pitch analysis that Kara has done throughout the years for a number of groups, and the model was predicting it's right in the middle of the trend, and you can capture a, a variety of conditions. And we recently are thinking of how to do the validation with um, EEG, so neural validation of the source location. The data that I'm showing here was recently published, although this was done as a initial part of the validation, and we were mimicking the things that Frank Gunter did at the beginning when he proposed uh, using uh, DIVA, and he did it with MRI, so we did it with EEG. Uh, we were able to navigate throughout all the noise and still find, uh, we found the sources that we were looking for. So, yeah, so we were excited about this uh, findings, and we're moving this into now the, not, not the form and frequencies, but also pitch uh, and primarily pitch for now. Uh, and we are adding new models like nodules and muscle tension dysphonia, paralysis. So, so the core of what we will be doing for the next few years as a lab is going to be in the development of speech motor control models uh, for a number of, of, of conditions and situations. Um, and then in the same way that we were able to readjust a model to fit better the data of one person. We're doing that, the same thing with the biomechanical, but also with the neural component. And this is going to be the dissertation of that gentleman over there standing in the back. Uh, so it's, it's fitting the data with neural experiments, which is very, very hard. So um, what is the connection with robotics? Well, we do have this iCup robot. The iCup robot is a uh, uh, it's a nice platform for doing this thing called co cognitive robotics, which is a connection with uh, between neuroscience and robotics. And I was pleased to see that it, it's also used in rehabilitation, as we were told in the previous talk. And what we're doing with this robot primarily is to connect our research in, in neural engineering with, with robotics. And uh, there are people here, uh, studying how to learn how to walk, how to learn to grab things, how to uh, uh, recognize the environment. And in our group, uh, we're starting to look at the idea of um, uh, 
teaching this robot how to speak and how to acquire language using Diva and Ladiva, and in the context of combining both uh, lip reading techniques with uh, it has binaural hearing and capabilities to produce sound as well. So, so that's sort of the core of what we're doing. It's a very initial thing, so I don't have any data to show on that project, but that's the idea that we have. <coughs> and it's going to be related to, to this idea of Ladiva. You add a particular face mask to, to the robot, and you can better see the, the lips, so that you can study all the nice different features that it will be associated to um, uh, voice production. And to finish, um, just a couple of uh, overall ideas that I want to reinforce. This idea of auditory voice monitoring, I think it's a neat thing. Uh, I've been saying this for several years now, but I think it's important that I keep repeating this thing, because it, it hasn't hit the clinic yet. Uh, for years, it was a, it was a phone, uh, so no one could get one of those, because it was only developed in a lab. And now there are companies who are interested in developing uh, we have one in Chile, but there are two in the States who are developing versions of this. And there are versions of Europe, in Europe, that have done previous versions. And I'm, I'm hoping that they will also try to update their system so that this, this idea of having voice monitoring, it will become the new standard for assessing uh, and keeping track of patients. And, and with the research that I'm sure we will hear later, uh, you'll see that it's pretty nice to use voice to combine and get additional information like cognitive loading and other sorts of uh, uh, areas where you can explore this potential avenue. So this is an important thing that it's coming. It's been in the research pipeline for a long time. Now it sh it's coming out in the market. So as clinicians, you should, you should see it very soon. Like, I mean, it's available. Uh, and with the idea of um, understanding, I'm, I'm almost done. With the idea of understanding what's happening, um, uh, there are new models like Ladiva that allow you to understand this connection between speech and hearing. And I think it's very important. And it just let me put an example. This is, this is not something we do, but I think it, it's, it's been done in, 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 at BU um, where they have demonstrated that certain voice problems are related to auditory problems. Uh, and it's not that the person has an auditory disorder or disease, it's just more like the integration between the two system is a little messed up. And, and that changes everything. And, and it's, a, it's an avenue for rehabilitation in this field that it's very important to explore. A key example is vocal hyperfunction, both nodules and MTD patients, patients with muscle tension dysphonia, have this thing. Uh, Keras Lab has demonstrated that they do exhibit differences against uh, control populations where they uh, have a completely different way of controlling their voice because of the way they hear themselves. So it's a very important thing, and it's very important to have tools to uh, help us explain why that is, and therefore hopefully create better therapeutical ways to help these patients. So and the last point is um, we are a group of engineers, and we're excited to provide assistance in, in, in these topics, because these topics are fascinating, and I think there's so much space where engineering can, can be uh, helpful here. Thank you. Thank you so, thank you so much, Matthias, uh, for your amazing talk. Uh, we don't have any questions in the app, but um, anyone would like to make a question now from the audience? Me pueden preguntar en español también. Por favor. Yeah. Sabemos que el tallo de los símetros es el que va a quitar todo el pie de la persona. Perdón, ¿cierto? Sí, sí, dale, dale, yo lo traigo. Sabemos que está el dosímetro que va registrando como la actividad de la persona durante el día. ¿Cuáles son las ventajas de este versus el dosímetro? ¿El dosímetro te refieres al dosímetro de audición? Eh, ¿Al el dosímetro asociado? ¿Hay un, ¿Respondo en español? ¿Hay, hay uno que registra? 
English. There's a thing called the decimeter, which is a thing that you typically wear to record the Please. SPL level, uh, sound production, uh, so, sound pressure level, sorry, sound production level. And that's useful when you have to decide, you know, uh, for uh, occupational uh, analysis and so on. Th this has a microphone, so you can get potentially the same information. The benefit of this is that you're recording your voice. The, the, it could record also environmental noise, of course. That's, that's also a, a capability. But it's meant to record your voice and to compare, uh, sort of, it, since it has an accelerometer from the inside, it will compare sort of the inside with the outside. So to, in a way, it's like efficiency. How much effort you're doing with your lungs and how much sound you're producing or, or the quality of that sound that you're producing. So it, it's a completely new way of thinking about this. It's not just recording the level. Does that help? Yeah. Anyone else will I a question? Oh, boy. Uh, Matthias, um, I, you had to say. Yeah, I did. Um, just on the same device, how long does the battery last? Um, the current version was meant to uh, record the two channel uh, at, I think it was like 15K as a sampling frequency mm -hmm. for two channel, and it lasts. Uh, 16 hours uh, directly, so it's meant to be a, a thing that you have to charge daily. Um, we, we, we could develop different versions, and, and uh, I, I show one that it's smaller. In that one, we're integrating the battery throughout the color, so it's a different thing that the battery, it's a completely different array, and that would last a lot longer, so you don't have to charge it every day. You can wear it for at least three days, and then you'll have uh, better performance. And the data storage, does it? The storage in the, in the version that we develop and then it's, it's currently available is, a, is an SD integrated car. So it's recorded in the car. What we found is that the part that was taking most of the power was writing the data into the SD car. So we're now doing it in a different way in the redesign approach. So, so yeah, so, so the, the, the minimum you need for the system to be functional, which is something we learned with the, with the phone, is to have eight hours of recording. Uh, just with the accelerometer alone, uh, and eight hours per day is enough for us to have a perfect uh, way of monitoring. We're adding the microphone, uh, so that uh, adds more complexity and more things that you can do with it. But we're plenty, we're plenty of battery power for that. Any other questions? I do have a question. Um, your model that you show um, in relation to the laryngeal muscles and your vocal folds model, uh, how can be applied in clinical work? How do you think it can be applied? You mean the, the one with intrinsic and extrinsic, or just intrinsic? Yes, intrinsic. Or, or any. Um, well, for instance, the, 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 the way of extracting muscle activity out of the accelerometer that you're wearing on your neck for hours a day is based on the model. So without the model, we wouldn't be able to do that. The model is the bridge between the input and output for us. It's the, it's the one thing that explains uh, how you could do that. So, so it's absolutely useful. So, so without the model, we wouldn't be able to do this. Uh, but that's the inverse problem. The model itself can be used to a number of other things so you can explain behaviors um, so for instance the in the clinic they're doing this simple regression between these two features uh, and what we've been doing is looking at what that means in terms of what's happening really with these two features so we've been trying to extract additional information directly from those it means that you're uh, you're responding really well or really bad to the therapy uh, what we're trying to obtain is what's happening. Are you using too much of effort or you're compressed or you're still too tense? So that's sort of the information we're extracting. And once again, that's done with the model. So, so models are not meant to be perfect, 
but as in the quote, are meant to be useful in this case. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much, Matias. Um, any other question? No? All right. Once again, thank you so much for your amazing talk, and this is a tiny present for your presentation. Um, around 20. <laughs>
Thank you, everyone. Um, we are going to start with our last talk today. Um, Professor Adam Bohel, Professor of Speech Neuroscience from the University of Melbourne, Australia, and his talk is about digital testing and rehabilitation of a speech impairment in neurodegenerative disease. Thank you, Sandra. Um, that was the most impersonal uh, introduction I've ever had. Sandra was my PhD student in Australia, and so she's tolerated me for a very long time. I want to wish my translators good luck. I have a strong Australian accent, and I speak very quickly. So, um, I'm from Australia, uh, down at the University of Melbourne, so right down the bottom. We're almost in line, though, with uh, Valparaiso and Melbourne in terms of latitude. We both live on the Pacific, which is lovely. And I, I will talk about my disclosures, actually. I should probably do that. I'm more professional than um, Matthias here. I'll mention the fact that lots of people give me money. Um, the companies here and the institutes and the charities have provided money to the company that I work with, but also the research that we do. If you consider any of these a conflict, then I'm very happy to talk about them more. So today I'm going to run through a few different elements of the work that we do both in my lab and the company that we work with. The company, Hayden Lab, have a big focus on clinical trial work. So we do, we're a biotechnology company and we do speech and language and swallowing testing in drug trials. So you saw from my disclosures, I work with uh, large and small pharma companies uh, and in that context, there are lots of requirements for us to be able to measure communication objectively. And I'll go through why you would even bother doing that, because I think some of the faces that I'm receiving suggest that you're not quite sure what the point is. Um, so if we think about digital assessments and biological assessments, these are the sort of techniques that people might use in a drug trial to demonstrate efficacy of the compound that they're testing. So trait and state biomarkers, things like uh, genetic testing and neurofilament light chain and PET testing, we don't do any of that stuff. But what we do try to do is link the behaviors that we're assessing, so things like speech and language and activity, to the underlying neuropathology. And the idea is that if you change the underlying pathology, you will change the behavior. And the behavior is talking. You can see I've highlighted or darkened three different bands of um, motor and cognitive assessments here. We've got speech, which is motor, language, which is cognitive, and then if you combine the two, you might have communication, which is a, an overall measure of quality of life, just to give you some context. We measure speech in a number of ways, and the FDA, so the Food and Drug Administration in the US, like to categorize everything that we do and the assessments are categorized in a particular way. The tools that we use usually in a clinical setting include patient reported outcomes, so PROs, which we've developed some of them. There's a, there's a tool called the dysarthria impact scale. And a lot of the other measures that are objective, things like acoustic analysis and natural language processing, are performance outcomes. So we measure performance outcomes to tell us about patient function. <coughs> You can do that in a number of contexts, and uh, we attended an institute this morning which were looking at things like passive data collection, so sensors in the home. You can also use digital apps, and we've seen that you can use very active engagement techniques like the voice activity detection that um, our colleague just said before. Um, I'm going to give some context around the clinical populations that we work with. Anything that's circled uh, has a red square around it is something that we've been working in personally. And um, if you think about splitting up the disease groups that we focus on, so almost all of them are progressive neurological, um, or they're affective, like schizophrenia or, or um, major depression, they are derived from diff breakdowns at different areas of, of speech and language control and processing. So today we're going to talk a little bit about schizophrenia and depression, a little bit on primary progressive aphasia, so these frontotemporal dementias. I, I don't expect you to 
have an understanding of what all these different disease groups are, but when I do mention one, I will um, go through to describe the phenotype, other types of dementia, and then we move into the more motor um, domains, things like multiple sclerosis or cerebellar ataxia, Huntington's disease, um, perhaps even some brain stem disorders and, or Parkinson's. So if we start at the very beginning of when we're going to do a speech assessment. So when I say speech, I mean everything that we sound like. So lots of people talk about voice being very important. I will say voice is a small sliver when it comes to the whole measurement of speech, which is respiration, phonamed, phonation, which is voice, articulation, resonance, and prosody, which kind of fits all around, which is not really a system in itself. We measure speech in a number of ways. And if you think about a clinical trial, you're going to assess patients regularly. So you'll take a baseline, then they get treated, and then you test them and test them and test them. And then hopefully the drug works and their speech changes. But to do that, we need to have a protocol that is very brief, but informative. It doesn't change with practice. You can imagine if you test someone and then you test them again and their speech changes, you'd say, oh, maybe they've improved. Or maybe they've actually just changed because you've tested them over and over again. So we've got tasks that fit on this motor cognitive complexity spectrum, starting with things like a sustained vowel, which is a very motor task, as you can appreciate, all the way down to something like a conversation, which is heavily loaded with um, a cognitive demand because you have to think about language contemporaneously. Um, we typically choose a just a small number of these tasks when we're eliciting um, behaviours and they might just include something like a syllable repetition, a reading and a vowel and that will give us enough information to tell us about the patient itself. Okay, so we focus on progressive neurolo neurological disease, so these are ones where a patient becomes symptomatic perhaps in the second or third decade of life and then they get worse and then they die. It's a pretty drastic process, but through that disease state change, the things that they're able to do also changes. So we all start, we typically start being able to walk, so full ambulation, then the disease progresses and perhaps we can't walk as much, so we need an aid, and we've seen some robotic work earlier today, which is incredible. I'm not sure how it will work with my patient groups, but there's, there's certainly potential there. And then lots of my patients become wheelchair bound. So lots of the assessments that people do, like the motor assessments, become quite problematic. You, you can't test limb, so you can't test gait and balance for someone who's in a wheelchair, for example. What you can test, though, is speech. Speech can tell us about the brain, but it also is very important for patients. Another consideration is that as speech declines in, in intelligibility, other tests become less accurate as well. So lots of cognitive tests that we do rely on verbal responses. But if you can't understand the response, is it an accurate representation of their cognition? So there are lots of tests like verbal fluency or single digit modality tests where the patient has to answer orally, but if they've got dysarthria, then they're slower. The, the uh, clinician perhaps can't understand them and therefore you give them a lower mark. They don't necessarily have a cognitive impairment, but they do have a motor one, which is compromising their cognitive performance. So this is probably the only engineering slide I've gotten the whole thing. It's not engineering at all, is it? It's really just a pipeline. Um, I love that line around uh, models are useless, because they are, but sometimes they, they might be helpful. Um, what we do is acquire data, and I just want to kind of walk through the process of collecting data and then analysing it. Start with data acquisition. I've already mentioned the tasks. I'm going to go through the hardware requirements. They're interesting-ish in terms of the method methodological approach, but uh, they do set the scene for the quality of data that you, come, that you get. Quality control is hugely important. You need to have a quality management system. People who are doing the assessments need to be trained. Everything needs to be standardised. Um, just like you would in any other experimental domain, except a pharmaceutical trial, the requirements are incredibly high. Um, we do two types of analysis within our group, natural language processing and acoustic analysis. And um, there comes a point where you need to think about how meaningful the outcomes are that we're measuring. We measure acoustic features 
let's say we do jitter and then we do pause length and then we do some MFCCs, what does that actually mean for the patient? Are any of these features actually going to tell us something about how intelligible they are or whether or not a change in them actually means anything to anyone at all? So we've got a, um, I'll just quickly run through this one, but we, there's a paper that uh, it's still a preprint. The journal took six months to get back to us. I tell you, associate editors for some journals are absolutely shocking. And I'm just looking at one of them right here. Here's a good one there. Um, it just walks us through what you need to do if you're going to assess speech in a clinical trial. So, I mean, lots of the stuff I've been talking about today is, is embedded within this. Hardware and software selection is really important. Um, Everything is recorded with a microphone, so that is the first gateway for every bit of quality that you've got throughout the trial. Um, and I've, I've already raised a couple of concerns around um, the, the war, not concerns, excited queries around the, uh, the neck-worn uh, microphone slash accelerometer. How long does it last? What's the storage like? How do you transfer data? All those things are really important. Stimuli is also important. I've already tap, um, tapped into the fact that uh, repeated application of a protocol can lead to changes in performance. And we just want to be able to make sure we're not doubling up or making assumptions about uh, change that aren't actually occurring. There are, as you know, thousands of different features we can use to um, analyse data, even from a speech point of view and almost equally for, for language, which ones are reliable, which ones are sensitive, which ones have been validated. I think lots of these things need to be considered when you're analysing data. We get asked a lot about uh, cross-linguistic um, challenges when it comes to um, producing a speech battery. So uh, because I'm a, a white man who lives in an English-speaking country, I'm blissfully unaware of everything that happens outside of my, my Western Hemisphere. But um, I appreciate that most people don't actually speak English as their first language, and neither do the people who are involved in our trials. So the company that we work for has 25 different languages and works across 300 sites in the world. That means that we've got a, a huge number of um, demands on how we interpret the data, but also how we deliver the, therap deliver the, um, the protocol itself. Um, I'm not sure if you're going to answer, but do, do you think there's any differences between my speech and your speech when it comes to timing, for example? Okay, so let's say you get treated for a particular disease and then your speech changes as a function of that treatment. I get treated and my speech changes. Are those changes equivalent? Even though our speech is different, I think it's something to consider. I just got asked that by one of our customers. Uh, my answer is, if it's a motor disorder, then your changes are equivalent to my changes because it's, it's the underlying pathology that's driving the behaviour. But if your speech is a stress-timed or a syllable-timed um, language, then your speech is probably faster than mine. Your syllabic rate is faster than mine. Spanish is quicker than English. Um, but do those changes change in the same way? So I'd like an answer by the end of the lecture, thank you very much. <laughs> With references, because I need to provide them to the customer and I haven't done that yet. Um, I'm not going to go through stats modelling, but it's obviously very important as well. We need to treat data in a particular way. So how can we use speech to tell us something about the patient? So we can use it as a screening tool. Uh, we can use it to assist in differential diagnosis. It's not very good at diagnosing. So. Even though I've got a study in here that says that we can do it with 98.5% accuracy, I'd, uh, I'm quite suspicious of my own work. Um, we can tell how severe a disease is based on speech or language, but again, it's, it's not perfect in that setting. We can track treatment change though, and I think that's a, a useful caveat to consider. And then touching again on what's actually meaningful for the assessment protocol. Are we measuring some esoteric signal processing feature made by some engineer who doesn't ever see a patient? Probably. But can we combine them in a way that actually means something for the patient themselves? And I'll go through what I think is important and what our patients have been telling us as well. That's a 
a horrible slide to look at because all the writing is tiny, but just starting to think about how we can use speech and language to help in a screening protocol. So, in a clinical trial for Alzheimer's disease, they might have to recruit a thousand patients and screen them to then include 300 people within that study because the screening process requires PET scans to look at amyloid deposition, cognitive um, performance, maybe some genetic screening. There's thinking that you can use something like a speech and language battery to give you a higher predictability of um, likelihood of fitting in within a particular inclusion criteria for a trial. And it's used in some contexts there, but I think there's a bit of a way to go. Similar for something like schizophrenia. So you can get a very diverse disease um, phenotype within schizophrenia. But if you can measure some of those key features before you even have to go through a very long battery, just by getting perhaps a phone call or recording that data and then analyzing it in an automated way, you can potentially save money unless you work with us and we'll charge you a fortune. You can use this stuff in another way by doing a quality control assessment of a clinical protocol. So the uh, PANS assessment for schizophrenia takes 45 minutes. In a clinical trial, that 45 minutes has to be used in a standardized way for every patient. So it has to be done exactly the same way. If you have a deviation because you've got 300 sites around the world, one person hasn't read the manual on how to do it, or they're just not very clever or they don't really care, then you're going to have corrupt data. But what you could do is just run some automated speech to text, analyze the content of that interview, and then use that to tell you if it's been done appropriately. So you've got it as a, a quality control tool as well. Here's, uh, so I've got lots of different studies. Uh, I've got an attention problem, so I only like talking about something for a very short amount of time, and I run to the next one. So each study pretty much has one slide to it. Um, this one is a review that's taken a year for one of my students to do. This one is a study that took Sandra and I three years to get published, I'd say. I'm going to blame the postdoc, though, because I've already told everyone about him. Um, Actually, our, our professor down here was the associate editor, and he really wants to have recognition for him pushing this paper through, so I only found that out yesterday because I didn't read any of his emails. Um, what we did in this particular study is we took three different groups. We've got healthy age and sex match control, so these are all individuals over the age of 50. Then we've got, they're not age and sex matched, they're just healthy people over the age of 50. Then we've got people with Friedrich's ataxia, and I'll go through what that is, but it's a cerebellar disease, who have quite pronounced dysarthria, so they've all got a motor speech impairment. And then there's multiple sclerosis, who have a subtle speech impairment, and some of them actually sound like they're healthy. In that context, we um, elicited a single task. So this is uh, syllable repetition, getting people to say patika, 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 uh, for 10 seconds as quickly and as clearly as they can. Then we threw a whole bunch of different acoustic features at it. And then my clever boy who wrote the paper did some machine learning. And you can see I'm really on top of that side of it. Uh, and this is what we found. And I think um, Matthias could do a better job at describing the paper. But what this is trying to do, and what our postdoc was um, pushing, is that you can diagnose a disease with just speech alone. And I still don't think you can do that. I also don't think that that's especially useful. I'd rather a genetic test to confirm something rather than a likelihood of something else. But you know, maybe there's something in it. OK, so that's screening and quality control. Then moving to an application that I have a particular interest in, and that's looking at people who are carrying a mutation of a particular disease but are not symptomatic. So there are autosomal dominantly inherited disorders to get that one, autosomal or dominantly inherited disorders that um, people are, have in the family. And they might know that they're going to carry this gene because perhaps their older brother or sister or their parents have got this disease. This particular study is uh, spina cerebellar ataxia type 2. And we ran this study in Cuba a couple of years ago. I think you're on this paper too, aren't you, Sandra? Yeah. Um, 
What we wanted to do is compare people who are carrying the mutation, the, the CAG repeat expansion, but are not symptomatic, those who are early stage disease, so they've had it for two or three years, but they are symptomatic, and then age and sex match controls, and see if we could differentiate the, the groups within that. What this slide is showing is that we can't really hear the differences that we're anticipating in, in the, the particular groups. So this is um, expert raters, and maybe you were one of those expert raters, Sandra, yep. Um, listened to the samples, blinded to group, and rated their severity of their dysarthria. We can see there's a little bit going on, maybe on something like mono pitch, but what I haven't included in here, which is pretty bad, is that is variability, but it's actually just frequency that we're measuring on the y-axis. So effectively, we can identify when someone that has the disease, but if they're not symptomatic, we can't hear it. So that's what I'm trying to establish there. If we then use some acoustic methods to evaluate the groups, we can actually differentiate pre-symptomatic, healthy controls, and early stage. Only on some tasks, though. So if we look on the right here, we can see, my cursor's not showing, the right-hand side, it's got speech rate written up the top. There's no difference in pre-symptomatic and healthy controls for the reading task, for example. There's, we couldn't differentiate the groups. What we can do, though, is separate groups when we have a task that pushes their motor system. So we've got a syllable repetition task again, similar to the previous study, where we're getting them to say it as quickly and as clearly as we can, as they can. In that context, we're, getting, we're pushing the system to the point that it can't cope with the demands of, of the, the sequence that they've got, and it's actually manifesting a little bit of the disease in there. So in that context, we've got a very sensitive, subtle marker of perhaps, perhaps change, even though this is not a longitudinal study, um, differentiating groups. And to demonstrate that further, right, we've applied it in um, another autosomal dominant disorder. So this is Huntington's disease. And I did say I would explain each disease group. Spinous cerebral ataxia is uh, an inherited disorder, as I mentioned, but it's primarily um, cerebellar, so they have gait and balance issues. You typically, typically get it in the fourth decade of life. Uh, often die from aspiration pneumonia, so from swallowing problems, or cardiomyopathy. There's about 100 of them, 100 different types, so there's a lot of them. Most common are scars 1, 2, 3, and 6. Huntington's, it's not dissimilar, but it's uh, more subcortical, so we have um, lesions beginning in the chordate nucleus. Um, you also have concomitant cognitive deficits alongside motor deficits, so you've got, you've got both elements that are at play here. Um, onsets often fourth to six decades of life, um, but again it's one of those autosomal dominant disorders where you can, when you know you're going to get it perhaps if you've done some genetic testing. And what we wanted to do here is make a greater definition or distinction between those who are pre-symptomatic, those who are almost symptomatic but not, and then early stage again. So you can have people who are in this pre-symptomatic group, which is the top group up here on the right. Um, you can see blue is healthy control, age and sex healthy controls, and the puce color, whatever it is, is the, the patient group. You can see there's only one or two participants who are fitting outside of that, that um, healthy range. But these people are 15 to 20 years prior to diagnosis. So these are a long way out from being symptomatic or reaching that diagnostic certainty. In, in the prodromal group, they're starting to manifest a little bit, but they're not meeting diagnosis. You can't say you've got Huntington's disease because they don't meet that criteria, but they are showing subtle signs of motor decline. We also have motor tasks here as well, like the Purdue pegboard task. If you're familiar with that, it's literally picking up a peg, putting it down, picking it up again, and it's a time task, and I think may even have some accuracy measures in there as well. These deficits that we're observing in the pre-symptomatic and prodromal group um, are exacerbated the further you go along in the disease. So again, this is not a longitudinal study, but it is prospective across different disease stages, and so what we can show is that very early on, you're starting to manifest some of, some of the declines that are manifest later on in the disease. So what's the point of that? Can anyone think of any applications for testing someone 15 years or 10 years or five years before they actually get diagnosed? 
I used to think that, but let's, let's imagine what's the best time to treat someone before all the neuronal damage is caused. It's very hard to reverse changes to the brain. And so the thinking from our sponsors is that if they can have a therapy that's actually protective or slows decline, then you can actually treat them early. It, it's almost impossible to run a trial if you don't have measures that are actually sensitive to change in that very early stage. So there's a, there's a kind of a, a big push to try to get to that point so we can actually have these pre-symptomatic tests. So we're pushing speech. Uh, cognitive tests are also useful. But if I go back to this slide here, this group up the top, they have no cognitive deficits at all. So what we really need to do is find those small group of individuals who are manifesting and then perhaps include them in the trial. The other ones get left off. OK. Linking brain and behavior is also another really important space within clinical trials, but also academic work. Um, this, uh, this group of diseases, so they're typically included within frontotemporal dementia. Um, so think about frontal lobe, temporal lobe, so that you get disinhibition, but also language um, deficits. It's probably one of the only disease groups where you can actually use speech and language to diagnose someone, because the phenotypes are actually the diagnostic criteria. There's four types, behavioural variant, which is, the name suggests, mainly behavioural. So they've got not so much memory issues, so it's not like an Alzheimer's disease, but they do have behavioural changes. So they might start to make decisions that seem out of place, or they might say inappropriate things, start to do things funny with their money, etc. Then you've got semantic, non-fluent, and logopenic. Logopenic is a uh, the underlying pathology is more like Alzheimer's, so they do have language problems and memory problems. Anyway, it's a, it's a complex space, but within this context, you can um, use speech to inform the underlying pathology. Uh, there's also another one, progressive apraxia of speech, but that's, that tends to begin very early, so it's a motor planning deficit, which then can manifest as one of these other ones. It often morphs into something like a non-fluent which is also an apraxia presentation, apraxia being a planning deficit. We ran a study a couple of years ago looking at um, people with autopsy-confirmed um, non-fluent variant of primary progressive aphasia. One of the challenges within this group of um, individuals is that people can present with non-fluent, but it actually turns into something like progressive supranuclear palsy or um, corticobasal degeneration, which are, again, two other different frontotemporal lobar degeneration diseases. I've thrown about five different diagnoses in there, I appreciate. That's not straightforward. But one of the diagnostic challenges is, is it corticobasal degeneration or is it PSP? And you can't tell that until someone has died, because you need to autopsy confirmed. And what we were able to show is that um, we can differentiate non-fluent from healthy controls using speech, um, just timing measures in this case. That's not that surprising, because it is a speech disorder. But what we were able to do is also separate those non-fluent PPAs versus non-fluent, um, sorry, non-fluent corticobasal compared to non-fluent um, primary super, uh, progressive supranuclear palsy, just using speech alone. And that's actually not straightforward, and we're able to um, verify that based on um, autopsy-based data, thus linking the neuropathology and the behavior itself. Then applying a, a similar but um, perhaps more informative approach in multiple sclerosis. And this work was done um, with one of my uh, old PhD students, Gustavo Noss, who's actually just across the road in Sao Paulo. For me, it's very close. Um, he was looking at multiple sclerosis, which I, I've mentioned is a subtle motor speech deficit, but linking it to disease severity, so using the overall disability score, the EDSS, a SARA score, which is a disease severity score, and then we had MRI data and also looking at uh, lesion load, which is so multiple sclerosis, I didn't provide a definition for that, is the most common neurodegenerative disease in younger people. 
and um, as the name suggests, you get multiple scars on the brain, and they can appear anywhere. We've got a particular interest in those who have um, lesions within the cerebellum, because that, that's the one that most affects speech. We also had some voice-related quality of life data there too. So, in this context, what we wanted to do was separate groups, and I mentioned it's subtle phenotype, um, separate groups out just using speech alone. We could do that, but you can see there's quite a bit of overlap. Um, there's a clear, strong um, correlation between motor speech impairment and disease severity itself. And then we're able to link um, and the underlying neuropathology to the speech outcomes as well. These composite measures that we've developed were focused on something that is meaningful to patients. And so in multiple sclerosis, people don't sound, you can still understand everything they say, but they don't sound healthy. So they've got a slight dysarthria and it makes them sound unnatural. And so we've got a measure of naturalness and we've developed a composite measure that uh, combines things like timing and voice quality and articulation, breath support, to tell us about naturalness in an objective way. There's often interest in speech replicating another domain of assessment. I find that really tedious because I think speech is way more important than almost every other domain. But we've, um, we've developed a, a model that actually is able to predict something like a nine-hole peg test. And I don't know if you're familiar with that task, but that, again, is literally picking up a peg and putting in a board, another one of these movement um, tasks. And you can do that with relatively high predictive value. Last one on these, these MS studies, what we wanted to do is demonstrate the sensitivity of objective, quantifiable acoustic measures of speech compared to what a listener might be able to do. So if someone ha sounds healthy, we give them a score of zero, zero being uh, unremarkable or there's nothing wrong with them. But acoustically, they're not, they're not actually healthy, they're not normal. We've all got something wrong with this. Maybe not me, but probably everyone else here. That's a joke, by the way. It's my Australian humour, so my apologies. Lo siento. Um, what we can do is examine how sensitive a listener is able to uh, determine severity versus the digital assessments. Red in this slide represents what a listener is able to do. What we can see is there's larger variability in scores and also an overlap between mild and moderate um, disease severity. What we don't see for the digital assessment is that overlap and we can see that it's actually more sensitive and is able to differentiate different levels of disease severity. This is important because it knows then we can demonstrate change over time um, with greater um, capacity. Last domain in uh, applications of speech is looking at change. So this is just some unpublished data looking at change over a 12 month period in Parkinson's disease. In effect, Disease gets worse, speech gets worse. I don't want to spend much more time on that one. I like this study, though. Um, that's why this is unpublished, because I'm just bored of it. This one's a nice study looking at the utility of speech to measure efficacy of drug treatment for major depression. So we, had, we ran a phase four randomized control trial, double-blinded, placebo-controlled. Uh, in 165 patients across 11 sites in the US. The data collection was telephone, so like a landline telephone, not even, not even a smartphone. Um, they had to phone up, do a prompted, computer prompted uh, protocol, and then we just measured things like timing and voice quality and format structure. And what we showed was that those who responded to treatment, so those who improved, had an opposite change in their speech to those who didn't respond to treatment, irrespective of placebo or sertraline, which was the active treatment. So speech changes with treatment, but it doesn't differentiate placebo, which if we could do, we would be um, probably wealthy. Okay, <clears throat> another way of demonstrating change in speech is, is inducing change in people. So we've spoken quite a bit about disease and even affective disorders and treatment but you can induce change in someone's speech just by doing something like keeping them awake. This study, we kept people awake for 40 hours in a lab. I would not participate in this study. I usually like to be part of things and trial them. Not for this one. They had to lie in a bed for 40 hours. 
They had to wee in a bucket. They had their diet controlled. The light was controlled. They took bloods. It's a terrible study. But really nice data, so that's probably the most important thing. And they got paid. So if we think about the slides on the right. So when you assess sleep or alertness, you do the same sort of protocol usually for every study. One is psychomotor vigilance task. So this is getting someone to look at a screen and a dot will appear and then it won't appear and you have to click a button when it appears and when it disappears. What people do when they're tired is they miss those. So they're inaccurate and they're slower. So PVT is always part of a protocol. What you also do is ask people if they're tired. So we, in this case, we use the Karolinska sleepiness scale and people are actually pretty good at identifying when they're tired. You can see on the top right, that's the, Carol, that's the KSS. That's a subjective patient reported outcome of how tired they are. The bottom right is the PVT, which is objective, gold standard assessment of alertness. They're pretty much exactly the same. Can you see any differences between the two? There's one interesting thing about it. Oh, there's lots. There's lots and lots. One thing is we start to identify when we're tired before our performance changes. So about two hours, so if you look at between eight and 16 hours on the top figure, you can see that performance starts to decline or self-rated, but it takes a little bit longer to happen on PVT. That's just one pint there. So we're pretty good at recognizing when things aren't going that well. Even our performance is, is a, there's a latency there. Then if we think about speech, so this is the four figures on the left, there's, it's a very different pattern of performance, isn't it? One, I think you could legitimately say is quite a bit of variability, so let's just pretend that's not there. So those error bars are pretty decent. But there's two mechanisms at play here. One, if for the counting task, we can see it's, it's not linear, but it is declining, performance is declining over the course of the experiment. On the left-hand side, we've got a reading task, so it's more demanding from a cognitive perspective, but it's actually following a circadian rhythm rather than a linear change like we see for PVT or sleepiness. I love this stuff. I really like this sort of experimentation. They're not sick, so that's a nice change because I have to work with patients all the time. And we're, in, we're demonstrating that there's a different phenomena at play here. So speech and language is telling us something different than traditional assessments and therefore could be used as part of a trial. At least that's what I'm telling people. Okay, that's, that's digital assessments and quantitative outcomes in clinical trials. I'm now moving to a clinical trial that we ran focused on therapy for people with dysarthria. So I'm gonna introduce the disease group and we'll go through there. It's a nice study. I'm biased, but I, I think it's important as well. And um, it's in Friedrich's ataxia and spina cerebellar ataxia. So I've mentioned these guys before. This is a, if you're interested, there's a paper written by a patient of mine, Dr. Peter Gibalisco. Um, I've been working with him for 17 years now. Really clever guy, but it's just him talking about how his communication and his disease has impacted his life. It's only about 1,500 words. It's definitely worth looking at how an intellectual, because he did his PhD in the politics of disability, considers the impact of and the biases that he's experienced. So briefly, his dysarthria has meant that people have treated him as though he has a cognitive impairment or an intellectual impairment just because he sounds different, even though he's probably brighter than lots of us. Um, it's also meant that he was unable to get up and do what I'm doing now because no one has the patience to listen to someone who can't speak clearly. So I've got a profound interest in supporting Peter and he's actually helped us derive the sort of measures that, that we use in our clinical trials. So can you be understood and do you sound different to your healthy age and sex match peers? And in that context, you can do that objectively. And I've got some speech samples that I will play so you can have a listen. Okay, so this has been quite a long journey to get to this therapy because it's not my primary focus of research. I, I've got a big focus on assessing people's disease and how it tr um, changes over time. But I started in a, a Friedrich's ataxia clinic. So I, I originally trained as a speech therapist uh, and I still have uh, two clinics that I work in. Um, this is a Friedrich's ataxia clinic in, in Australia and we got referrals from across Asia Pacific. 
what would happen is that because we're a tertiary referral center, we have patients come in, I would assess them, say what I think, and then I would refer to clinics all around uh, the, the, the region. But what I found is I couldn't refer them saying this is the treatment you should be doing because there's no treatments available. That gave me cause for frustration. We then wrote a, a there was a global initiative to write some clinical guidelines for how to best treat people with Friedrich's ataxia. I wrote the speech and swallowing ones and we had no treatments that had any evidence base for treating dysarthria in this population, which is professionally quite embarrassing. I think it's a terrible state. Then I thought, well, let's just do a systematic review. Surely someone's done something. Turns out no one's done anything. The largest study was a case study, and it was in a speech treatment that doesn't apply to this particular group. So we then thought, well, we're going to have to do something else. So we went about documenting all of this, you know, because I like assessing people. We went and documented every speech and um, communication problem that they had across a whole bunch of different cerebellar ataxias, rare and um, recessive, and also common and um, dominant uh, in spinal cerebellar ataxia. And so these are just some examples of what were going on. And then we looked into how to best design a behavioral therapy that is best suited for a group of patients who, and I'll describe the phenotype, they end up in a wheelchair, they have difficulty communicating, as we know, they have limb ataxia, so they can't use their hands very well at all. They've got a square wave jerk, when, so they don't have a smooth pursuit. If we look at a moving object and our eyes follow it, we'll have tiny little movements, but at least it'll be relatively smooth. When they do it, their eyes kind of do this, which means they can't follow things like a mouse um, pointer on a screen. So there's a number of physical deficits that mean it, it's very hard to provide them with any technology to assist their performance. Um, so we needed a therapy that was engaging. It had to maintain people's interest and get them to do the therapy every day. It has to be accessible. So we're thinking it had to be at home, has to cater to the diverse abilities. So some of our patients have cognitive impairment, they've got a processing speed issue and all of those other motor elements I've mentioned. Um, the feedback has to be multimodal. So they've got a cerebellar deficit, which means their feedback loop is, is also impaired. When they speak, they can't accurately hear and then modify their own motor plan to improve their own speech. So as part of that, we felt we needed to enhance self-monitoring as a therapeutic tool. So we've got oral, visual, and then performance-based feedback. Has to be relatively cheap. I don't know if you know many people with a profound physical disability, they're not high earners. It's very hard to maintain a job. They're usually on um, some sort of financial benefits. Therapies that work are high intensity. I would love a therapy you can do like once a week or once a month, but it just doesn't do anything. So this is something you have to do in a, a, very regularly. So, 2011, we made a therapy. It was in a booklet. Uh, it was a pain in the ass to deliver. It wasn't engaging, and a clinician had to deliver it to them. Then I thought, you know what? There's already a tool that we could use. We can use, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but there's a game called SingStar on PlayStation. Yeah? You know what? I don't like it, but I'll tell you what it's got. It has visual feedback. You sing. That's probably quite hard to see, but if, when you sing, your vocalizations are visualized. You can see how long you do it. It also has your pitch on there as well. So we've got two types of feedback there already. It's engaging if you like singing. I like singing, but I don't like singing for, for SingStar. Um, you, the stimuli is already there as well because you're singing songs. So it gives you a score at the end as well. I mean, it's perfectly designed for therapy, I thought. So we ran it in 10 patients and uh, what do you think they got better at? Singing? Yeah, you'd think. Maybe they get better at singing? I didn't even measure that. Probably should have. Um, they got better at uh, turning it on and playing it, but not necessarily anything to do with speech, which is a real shame. Maybe a little bit of resonance improved if you, if you believe the perceptual judgments we did. So it didn't work. Uh, even though we delivered it in an intensive model and did all the other things that I've mentioned in terms of an effective treatment. But it did have the elements to it. So we went back and we thought, well, okay, that's not going to work because you have to really like singing 
and we also found you have to know the song. If you don't know the song, the cognitive demand of trying to learn the song and read the lyrics and do the timing and the pitch changes and make your speech better makes it too demanding. It doesn't work. Um, made a really <clears throat> unpleasant to look at therapy that had all the elements that we wanted, but um, it was clunky. We made it in MATLAB, and I think I, we spent $5,000 on it, and it was, it was fine. Great pilot tool. Then we made a follow-up one, and I'll go through what these look like. So, aims of therapy. Improve intelligibility, improve naturalness, and to do that, we're going to improve self-monitoring. That's, that's the model of delivery that we got. So what I want to do is play two speech samples of two patients that give you an idea of the sort of challenges that we've got from a, a clinical perspective. So I speak English, but I can only pick up one word in that one. So that's Peter. That's Peter Gibusko, who wrote the paper with. Um, he's obviously deteriorated a lot from the point of when he first finished his PhD. But that is a patient who wants a therapy to improve his speech. That's a huge challenge, I think. We need to get him to be able to do a therapy and on a regular basis. You can imagine how hard that is to be able to communicate like that. It's also got an Australian accent. You can't even hear it, can you? So if we go back to my previous point around, does linguistic changes uh, or language-based challenges manifest in the same way across languages? It does, because he doesn't sound like he's Australian. He sounds like he has dysarthria, which maybe is his own accent. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Quite a strong Australian accent. Um, a guy has dysarthria. I think you can hear it. Did you notice anything? I'm going to do it again. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Can you, what elements of his speech do you think sound dysarthric? Yes. Yes, yeah. So he's, he's got imprecise production of consonants. His S's sound prolonged. He's a bit slower. His resonance is slightly different but he's fully intelligible. He was just saying the days of the week. Um, he is also part of our trial. Well, not him personally, but that profile is. So we need to improve people with intelligibility issues and naturalness issues. Both of them potentially equally important, um, but it means we've got a really wide span of uh, severity that we need to deal with. Okay, so our primary, we've done our pilot studies and I'm gonna show you what the data that looks like. But the therapy itself is a home-based treatment. So we wanted to make sure that people didn't have to leave the home. They could just do the therapy whenever they felt like it. We designed it to be on an Android device at the time. It's five days a week for four weeks. So there's 20 sessions there. We also had a maintenance period. Because some people wanted to keep doing it. I, yeah, I think that's good. If they want to keep doing it, it's excellent. 45 minutes a day if you have the speech of that second person. So a mild dysarthria it's 45 minutes. If we do it, maybe it's 35 minutes. If Peter does it, it's an hour and a half. So we've already made it very difficult for him to complete the therapy. And it's a, it's a huge ask for him. High intensity, high frequency, multimodal feedback. So we first, uh, if we look at the study on the right hand side, we first ran a pilot um, in this rare, super rare ataxia called ARSAX. Um, why would we do it in this rare one? Because they gave us money to do it. We applied for grants everywhere, and this charity in a tiny little province in Canada have an interest in this disease group, and they said no one has paid attention to our speech ever. Please do a trial for us. Um, these guys have ataxia, so they've got the dysarthry profile and a cognitive impairment. So we ha then had to say, right, this therapy has to be so easy to complete that someone with a cognitive impairment can do it at home without a therapist, which adds another level of complexity to it. Importantly, we saw an improvement in intelligibility when we had blinded raters, so blinded to time point. If we look at, so we're on the right hand side, uh, it says intelligibility on the monologue. This is the primary outcome measure. There's a slight uptick in intelligibility, but it's perceivable, and so therefore the trial was considered successful. 
We then repeated that pilot protocol in Friedrich's ataxia and spinal cerebral ataxia. So this is about 20 patients, more severe dysarthria. And again, we saw the primary outcome measure, which is in the, on the left-hand side of the screen on the top left figure, a larger improvement in performance, which is fantastic. So what we're showing here is that people with a moderate dysarthria improve more than those with a mild dysarthria, as you'd expect, because there's more room to move. Um, but also we've run it in two independent trials, blinded raters, it worked both times. That would suggest that it's gonna work every other time you would do it, wouldn't it? You'd think anyway. Okay, so I then chased money. So we've had two successful trials. I want some uh, money to run a proper trial. Randomized control trials cost a fortune. And um, fortunately, these, one of the Australian research councils gave us some money and then a large charity in, in America gave us some money. And so we're off and running. Uh, the design is a individually randomized control assessor blinded two arm parallel design. So that means we had a delayed entry. We've got people who do the baseline test, pre, uh, sorry, pre baseline, baseline, and then one group starts treatment, the other one just remains on standard care. Standard care is whatever you're getting at the time, that's pretty much nothing. This is the product, this is the population description. So you can see we've got 79 people in one group, 81 in another. That makes this the largest dysarthria trial ever run in any population anywhere in the world. Quite proud of that bit, you can tell. Uh, it also means that we're adequately powered. So there's a couple of things to take away from here. We've got four countries that we're running this in. So we've got cross-linguistic comparisons here as well. So France, Germany, New Zealand, and two sites in Australia. Um, most people, so more than two thirds of people, were not getting any current therapy at all. And we've got a nice split between ataxia, spinous cerebral ataxia and, and free ataxia. Here is the treatment itself. So it's just on a tablet. It's nothing amazing. The, the therapy exercises are not remarkable. They are really solid traditional therapy tasks, but we've embodied them within an, a, a, a biofeedback model. Quite hard to see, but on the left-hand column up there, it just walks the patient through every task they have to do every session. They're not allowed to skip tasks as much as they would want to. And I think almost everyone said, can we please skip tasks? Because I hate doing some of these ones that we've got. We've got a breast support challenge. So they just have to say, ah, for as long as they want. So as long as they can, they have to do that multiple times. Then we've got a crescendo to crescendo. Then we've got a pitch glide. Then we've got articulation exercises and generalization tasks as well. So they have to do all those tasks and then apply them in a context that's outside of the therapy. And that might be, we'd ask them a question like, how do you make a cup of coffee or read this or have a conversation? The idea is that they overwork their system. So they have to over enunciate everything they say over and over and over again to the point that they actually just improve function through overuse of, of their motor system. The feedback is visual. So we've got a, just a really straightforward intensity bar and that's just giving us an idea of how stable their vocalization is. We have um, performance feedback. We're not saying you've got a score of X or Y because that's relatively meaningless to a patient. We're just saying that is better or worse than yesterday. And they have to listen to themselves, so oral feedback as that third form that's probably the most important. They have to listen to themselves over and over and over again. Can you think of any um, impact of that? Because there's a side effect to that. So if you've got a fatal illness that will eventually kill you and it's impacting your speech and you don't know how bad it is and then you have some mug giving you a therapy that makes you listen to yourself every day over and over and over again, it doesn't make anyone happy because they actually get quite good at listening to themselves and recognizing what's wrong. So in one way, the therapy is great because it makes them better at self-monitoring, but I've had plenty of people say, I hate how I sound. Now, I don't like how I sound, but I don't have a progressive disease. These patients are coming forward with a dysarthria and they genuinely didn't know that they were that bad. So if I was running a drug trial, that would be an adverse effect because the treatment itself is inducing change, a negative change in the behavior of the patient. So 
complete a task, you listen to yourself from yesterday, then you get a score, uh, and then you run through those tasks, and I guess, does it actually work? Um, well, the short answer is yes. Quite pleased about that. Not to the huge extent that I was hoping for. We saw in those two small preliminary studies, um, most patients improved. And uh, just to go through what some of this data looks like. So I mentioned that we've got a delayed entry treatment trial. So we've got in the yellow line, treatment commenced at time point two. In the blue line, treatment commenced at time point three. So we can see an uptick in intelligibility. So again, the primary outcome measure in the yellow line. And then um, the figure on the right is actually change from baseline. So again, an improvement. What's the point of having two baselines? Is there any point, apart from wasting people's time, costing money? Well, if we go back to the digital outcome measures we mentioned before, we've got to have an understanding of how stable our measures are to make assumptions about how sensitive they are. So if we've got two baselines where they stay the same, and then there's a change, then we know that change is meaningful. It's not because of the treatment, the, the, it's not because of the assessment, it's because of the treatment itself. So we saw improvements in both groups post-treatment. Something, on that figure on the left-hand side in the blue line, you can see patients are actually getting worse again, almost, well, it's immediate, it's four weeks later. So I think there's something in that as well. Treatment is effective while you're doing it, but when you stop it, it's not necessarily still going to be there. And what I'd hope was that we would treat someone and their speech would be better for six months. But I think their speech actually gets worse quite quickly. An analogy is, um, <coughs> I go swimming all the time as my exercise. If I don't swim for a couple of weeks, I already feel my fitness deteriorating. And the same thing happens. So I don't know if you guys um, go to the gym. I don't. But if you go there and push tin to build up your guns, that will, I'd be interested to hear how they translated that. Um, pushing tin is an analogy for doing weights. Um, uh, if you don't do that for a month, your muscles will waste away. It's just going to happen. And the same thing happens for speech therapy. It's really disappointing. So you do need a maintenance period. Definitely needs to be there. I guess, I mean, and it's slightly significant, less than 0.05 adjusted, that's enough, but it's not as huge as what I would like. Um, if you then combine the time points, combine the groups, we can see there's actually a pretty decent treatment effect because it's 165, 160 patients. So naturalness and intelligibility improve, but the larger improvement is on the primary outcome, which is intelligibility. Okay, clinicians rating speech. So these are a neurologist, they use a scale of one to four, really crude, but they think that that's most important. When I say clinicians, I mean a neurologist. Um, that showed a very large, significant improvement uh, in intelligibility. We also saw a significant improvement in speech-related quality of life. So all of the things we want to move have, have moved. And then we asked patients, did you actually think that your speech improved? And we can see that around 90% of the patients agreed or strongly agreed with the statement, your speech has, imp has improved as a function of this treatment. We've received a huge amount of positive feedback, which is great. Um, the problem is I don't have another therapy to give them because we built this crappy Android thing four years ago. Maybe I need some help. Um, yeah, good. And uh, I don't have the answer. I can't just say, well, here's the next solution. but. We are building it, we just haven't done it yet. Uh, and then around the same proportion thought it was a good use of time. I think that's quite important. Even though the therapy itself was super boring and repetitive, people still felt value in it. They also thought it was good value for money, but it was free. So I can't, I don't even know what I'm asking there. Oh, I'm done. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Adam, for Pleasure. your amazing talk. <laughs> um, I have a bunch of questions here. Um, OK, what signals are you recording for your battery of tests? Any aerodynamic recordings, respiratory? 
And if you could record or estimate any signal other than a microphone, which one would be the most useful for, uh, to your work? Uh, so one of the demands in a clinical trial is it has to be super easy to use. And so a microphone is ubiquitous. And so we can use um, commercially available provision devices to make it easy to co collect data. Um, that means specialised equipment is very hard to get into a trial because no sponsor wants to pay for it. Um, it also requires additional training. I've mentioned that we might have 300 sites in a trial. Um, you're going to have 50 of them who are useless. And so you need to have something where it's super easy to use. So we only record speech and voice. We don't record respiratory anything, anything else. If I was going to do something, it would be activity. And I think the stuff that you've got is probably the way to go if you're going to just take off that, that level of um, fidelity. So if you've just got energy, frequency, then that's, that's, that's what I'd be doing. Thanks. Um, do you think your findings would differ in different languages? For example, using uh, syllable rate to discriminate control from pre-ataxia and early ataxia? Uh, so that study was... The first one was done in Spanish, and it worked then. Uh, I mean, I, I do argue that it helps within subject. You can differentiate within subject very easily because it's always going to be the same person and their change. It's less useful when you're trying to separate groups. So it's, it's a challenge, but in clinical trial, it's always the same person following that person. Um, if I was to compare my syllable repetition with, with Spanish, then mine is different. And so therefore, you might have some diagnostic challenges there. Great. Um, how do you deal with the large variability in the acoustic signal, even within one subject? So we standardize uh, across a number of different domains. The first one is training is super important. So we need to have a, uh, a clearly defined manual then we provide training, and then we certify that training. We certify it by having a mock run, so that patient or the, the tester would go through the protocol, then they give us the data, and then we look at that. We make sure everyone has the same microphone, they've got the same physical setup. We make sure that the stimuli itself is repeatable, sensitive, and stable in the absence of change. So you need to have something that's suitably motivating and short, but also meaningful. So there are five or six different criteria that we use to make sure that the variability is as low as it possibly can. But if you have, um, we've got some studies where we collect data in the home by a bring your own device and people set it up in their kitchen or their lounge room or whatever, we've got quite a bit of variability in that setting, especially when they've got an Android or an uh, iPhone or a different microphone and it makes it quite hard to do it in that setting. Right. Um, what acoustic features are you using for these studies? Do you do separate feature selection for each study? Do you remove redundancy too? So we have a set battery and we have a core um, corpora of, of features that we use across most of the disease groups. Where we differentiate diseases is we have composite measures which have been pre-validated um, using our testing um, cohorts. So composite measures of intelligibility and naturalness are disease specific, but then we have measures of prosody or voice quality or spectral change um, that we would use across diseases. DIVA has been used to model and study some of the speech disorders you have explored. Have you compared your findings against DIVA? Are your findings in agreement with it? With, what's the first word? DIVA. Hmm? Never heard of it. What's that? <laughs> We, yeah, so it's, um, I, I'm, I'm too stupid to use theoretical models, so we just use data. So um, we, I usually go to my students and say, theories are for people without data, and so that's why they do it. I love saying that one. Um, when I was thinking about my work more, I think I used to, we've certainly cited DIVA a lot, and I'm glad that there's actually some improvements and refinements to it, because it's, it's definitely needed. Um, we still focus just on behaviours and linking to the underlying pathology, so there's not that very clever link between anything else, and, and I'll, I'll pause it because it's, I'm just not clever enough. 
What do you think um, the variability hair bars were so large for the grandfather passage in the sleepness study? Well, so that's between subject variability. So I, I suspect that there's quite a bit, bit of variability across the participants within that. We all do respond differently to um, challenges like staying awake for 40 hours and some people are perfectly reasonable at it. I remember before I had kids, I, I had to have eight hours sleep Otherwise, I would be a monster. Now, it's nothing. So individual variability is where it's coming out. It's not within subject in that setting. So if we shrunk that down to within subject standard deviation, it's actually quite tight. Um, how receptive the clinical and medical communities are to these new acoustic assessment tools? How could we accelerate the clinical translation of these new methods? So uh, I. A biotech company paid me to do my PhD f a long time ago, and they pushed this product to the pharma market, and no one bought it. And then seven years later, uh, one of the pharma companies came to me and said, can we do this in a clinical trial? My mentor said, ask them for half a million dollars, and they actually said yes, and then we started the company. We've been doing it for seven years, so we're not new, but we're not old. And we're in this funny point where there is some industry acceptance, but it's not ubiquitous. And so we'll meet some pharma companies who will say, why would you even measure speech? Like, well, you just told me that using words. And if you couldn't talk, then therefore we've already seen intrinsic value in it. Then we need a lot of data as well. And we hold a lot of that. And so it's just a matter of getting out there and, and talking about it. So it's not new. I mean, people have been doing acoustic stuff for 100 years. So um, just the acceptance of the space. It's, that's, and it's, it's pitched as a digital outcome, which I think restricts it, because people say well, there's a clinical outcome and a digital outcome. But this speech is a clinical outcome. We just use objective measures to talk about it. So people like me talk about it all day long. And I think that's how it changes. Um, I've been meeting with the FDA the last couple of months, which is nice, because it's taken seven years to get to those meetings, but it's, it's, it's coming. Mm -hmm. Clinical practice, I think, is a different thing. On the slide 44, does the type of music or the selected sign you use make a difference? Yeah, it does. So um, this is the SingStar work. As I mentioned, if the patient doesn't know the song, then they can't do the therapy because it's too hard to learn it and say the words and do the therapeutic targets simultaneously. Um, I found that as well, because we, we piloted it quite a bit. We were unable to get patients to, um, I, I was unable to, to be able to focus on over-enunciating when I didn't know this song. Plus, there was only like 15 songs to choose from and they're stuff that I don't want to sing. So um, we had we selected we had ten people recruited. One person said, "I absolutely hate singing. I'm not doing it." And they did one session. So it's already self-selecting ten percent in our sample. Songs are really important, um, but I still there's something in it, and we have been piloting it in children. So moved it away from adults. And Mia, uh, Maya St John's doing it. One of our co-authors. Yeah. So assuming that you do know. Assuming that you do know the, the songs, like all of, all of them, mm -hmm. uh, do you think that the type of song or the genre or something would make a difference? Uh, I, I didn't delve deep enough into it, but I imagine it has to have a, enough diverse phonetic repertoire for it, you to be able to over-exercise your, your right. system. Right. And we know that singing itself improves speech. So what I should, probably should have included in here is some of the work we've been doing in Parkinson's disease. There's a, a great initiative called Parkinson, um, which was developed by people at the University of Melbourne. Um, that's a series of, um, of RCTs which has demonstrated efficacy of choir-based singing to improve loudness in, in Parkinson's disease. If you're familiar with speech treatments in Parkinson's, the one treatment that is proven to work is uh, the Lee Silverman voice technique treatment, LSVT. We actually showed a larger uh, treatment effect based on choir-based singing. Now, I only joined that collaboration because I thought there's no way in hell having a sing-song in a choir is going to improve loudness for a patient group. 
And I said, I will prove objectively that this doesn't work. And then it did, miraculously. And they've run four trials and then all of them have worked. So it's an interesting proposal, but maybe it's just singing. I thought singing would make you good at singing, not, not speaking, but it turns out there's some generalization things. Okay, um, last question. Um, have you used long terms, for example, um, more than an hour conversational or running a speech in your analysis? Do your findings with that data correlate well with simple lab recordings? So we have a study running at the moment where we're recording people for two weeks continuously. This is looking at um, audio events within the home. So aside from all the privacy issues, because I've been testing our products and I hate having the recordings on, it's basically just me yelling at my kids, my kids yelling at each other, then yelling at me again, and then me yelling at my wife. So it's just recording our family dynamics. I don't know why people would accept this as part of their, their, their life. But in that, there's huge challenges, aside from privacy, of getting the meaningful bits that you want. So you can record an hour-long conversation, um, but we're, what we're trying to do is capture like a week's worth of communication and then use that to tell us about patient function. So we, we focus on these isolated single tasks. Maybe that's not the best way to do it. I think it is, but maybe it's not. So maybe these very long recordings are the way to go. But then you have to find the bits you want and then um, clean all the data up and then analyze it. And it's, it's a huge logistic problem. Okay, anyone would like to make another question? Otherwise, ah, uh, you? Sorry, g given that you, you mentioned this thing of privacy and um, in, the, in the, these monitors, that, like the one I was showing, since the beginning, the, the privacy in long-term recordings has been a huge concern especially because you might be recording people who have not agreed upon to be recorded, so it's a, big, it's a big deal. So what people typically do is the, they use the accelerometer signal primarily, which is one of the reasons why we use the accelerometer, because it's not intelligible. So you can get, you can get still subtotal pressure, you can still get fundamental frequency, you can get a number of things, but not, not the resonances, so it's not intelligible. You cannot tell what they're saying. Um, and when you add additional sensors like a microphone, you don't record the signal, you record features of the signal. So that, that's, that's the way you deal with like long-term recordings and privacy issues. And you do speech analysis to avoid having other people in, in the recording as well. So there are several ways to deal with, with these issues that you were referring to. Yeah, I, I buy it, except your microphones are like eight grand. So yeah. if you can make them $100, I'm in. Great. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Adam. Um, uh, for you. Um, well, we have finished our session today. Thank you so much for coming over. And uh, I'll see you tomorrow for our last session. Thank <laughs> you.